Hey everyone. It's been a while. It's been a while. Tell him it's been a while. Say I missed you. No? You want to go back to sleep? Okay. Doesn't surprise me. Welcome. Welcome. Are we ready for this to be over with? Yes? Yeah? Just leave it alone? Yeah? Share? Share. That's what it is. Share with your friends. Okay. Penny says hi. She says she misses everybody. And somebody told me they needed some penny time. It had been a while. So here's your penny time. I'm going to hit play on this. And we are going to go cuddle up and take a nap with our, our new blankie that we got from Meg's merch shop. But I'll tell you about that later. And First, we have the closing arguments, and then we will have the jury instructions. So let's do this thing. I'll move for the next report. Thank you, Deputy Gordon. Hello, smaller number of jurors. How is everyone? It's Friday morning. I hope no one got here at 8. Um, we quite appreciate everyone being on time, but when you flip that switch, the little light goes on. It's great. Uh, annoying buzzer goes on as well, so you immediately pay attention when you press the button. Um, we are ready for closing <laughs> arguments. Um, the way closings work in civil cases is that the party that brings the initial claims has the ability to open and close, first word, last word. Um, this is a little complicated because we have sort of two, we have two, not sort of, two sets of claims, um, but the um, first set of claims brought would be the Anderson's claims, and so Mr. Edwards has the ability to open and close. You can waive your opening, which Mr. Edwards has done, so he's going to get up in front of you one time um, at the very end when everyone else is done. That means I turn to the David's lawyers to say, what are you going to do? And they, of course, need to give, if they choose to give a closing, talk to you about their defense against the claims, but they also are proponents of counterclaims. And in theory, they could wave that opening to try to have the last word, but that gets kind of complicated. So we're actually going to hear first from Ms. Sturm on behalf of Davids concerning a defense to the claims and um, a um, being a proponent of the counterclaims. Then we'll hear from Ms. Medwick defending against the counterclaims. If Ms. Medwick says something that Ms. Sturm really, really, really wants to get up and rebut, she has that right to close opening and closing on the counterclaims. So she may sandwich what Ms. Medwick has to say. But when Ms. Sturm is done, Ms. Medwick is done, then Mr. Edwards is going to get up and say, let me tell you about the Anderson's claims. And he'll have the last word. When he's done, I will give you the law. That's what we've been talking about this morning. Distill it down to something that I will share with you when it's my turn to address you all. And then you'll be able to deliberate. Now, this isn't going to take five minutes. So... Uh, we'll be done today. You'll get the case today. That's not my point. But we may have a break in the midst of closings. It may be at the end of closings, we break before I give you the jury charge. We'll fit lunch in there somewhere. We can make it a short lunch, figure out if we can get lunch brought in, as I know you all want to get this case so you can begin um, the last part of your job, the most important part, which is your deliberations. I just wanted to give you a forecast of what today is going to look like. Um, and with that, Mr. Stern. Before she gets started, I just wanted to note that the reason it's zoomed in is there was nothing on the screen and I kind of got sick looking at nothing. So I zoomed in on the Davids. The Andersons are not in the courtroom and they are not in the courtroom the entire time that they're not being shown on the screen. When they do show up in the courtroom, I will zoom back out and you'll you'll see that. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, ladies, gentlemen of the jury. Um, first, let me take this opportunity to extend both on behalf of my client and myself our wholehearted gratefulness for you being here. Um, we understand, we certainly do, that this is time away from things that you have to do. Um, and those things are important. Um, and so we appreciate your patience with us. If you've learned something, you've learned one that the legal field is not good with technology, right? 
Bright idea of some entrepreneurial mind out there. <laughs> we need help. Mm -hmm. um, but in all seriousness, um, we do need your help. And we do appreciate that patience that you've extended us. We didn't want you here. We certainly did not bring this lawsuit. We didn't envision we would be here. We didn't envision that we would have to bring 12, now nine of you into this nightmare with us. That is not at all where we thought this would go. And so we really appreciate your time, your consideration um, in helping us resolve this. You heard my clients say, they want and need this to stop. It's their home, right? I don't have to go back there when this is over. You all don't go have to go back there, but these parties do. They're gonna be living next door to each other. And so we need your help. Um, and what we're asking for is we think it's real simple. I told you at the beginning of this case, this is a case about interference with easement rights. It's real simple. You've heard the evidence. And we're asking at the end of this, when you go back and deliberate, that you return a verdict denying all of the Anderson's claims and returning a verdict in favor of the Dubbies. And that's on their claims and damages. You heard me say it's not a difficult case. I told you that at the start. I said, we've got, it's an easement case. And in this case, we have an easement agreement. So we've got a document in writing telling us how, the, how this easement works, right? I want you to keep in mind one thing. When we started this case, right? The Andersons put up their claims. What did they not show you? They did not show you that easement agreement, right? They didn't want you to see it. They didn't want you to read it. They didn't want you to hear me talk about it. There is no dispute. The Andersons purchased property subject to the easement agreement. Mr. Anderson admitted it, bought it, knew about it, got a copy of it several occasions. The Davids purchased the neighboring property subject to the same easement agreement. Easement two, which is at issue here. Davids can use for any legal purpose whatsoever. If they wanna build a shrine, they can build a shrine provided it doesn't defeat some kind of zoning or land use code. If they want to build a parking area, they can build a parking area. Again, we got to make sure we're complying with zoning and land use laws. If they want to walk across it, they can walk across it. If they want to play lacrosse on it, they can play lacrosse on it. If they want to sit on it, they can sit on it. If they want to use it, as a natural vegetative buffer for privacy in its natural state. They can do that. There is nothing unlawful about that. Again, the Andersons knew about this easement agreement when they purchased the property. And I want you to remember they purchased their property only a year and a half before the Dobbies. They did not do anything with easement two until after the Davids move in. Mr. Anderson tried to change his testimony on that on the stand. But you will recall I deposed him and he said there had been no use of easement two before the Davids purchased. I want to talk a moment about the claims that the Andersons have brought against the Davids. And you heard me talk about them in opening as well. Um, one, you heard me say, don't be fooled, right? These are distractions because of the conduct 
and the activity that is carried on in this case. They're intended to distract you. They're intended to make you think, oh, there's something else here. There's nothing else here. It's clear. It's a case about interference with easement rights. But what they want to claim are some other things. And I want you to pay attention because these are manufactured claims. And you need look no further. You heard it in the opening statement from opposing counsel, Mr. Edwards, when he said, in my office, when we get a demand letter, that means you're a defendant. Right there, he told you that the point was not, I'm going to reach out to the other side and see what can be done. It's, we're going to sue you. And that coincides actually with what his client's perspective was too. You can look at, I think it's Defense Exhibit 25. It's an email from Mr. Anderson to his landscapers. And that's when he got caught when Mr. David caught him trying to fence off easement to from the David property. Mr. David called up Mr. Anderson, and apparently Mr. Anderson sent an email to his landscapers. And in that, he tells them, I'm gonna, you can read it, it'll be in evidence. But he says, one, the French dude's right. Assuming that's Mr. David. Two, he says, I'm going to go ahead and consult my legal team. I'll get the legal fight going. That's October 5th of 2020. That's before my office does anything. We're not even retained. But it's before any cease and desist letter. It's before any notification. The strategy here on the Anderson side, as I told you before, it's to intimidate, it's to harass, it's to bully. These are all the things we see out of folks who bully. I am going to bully, intimidate, and harass you to prevent you from doing what is rightfully yours to do. As a society, we should not stand for that. And as jurors, I hope that you do not stand for that kind of behavior. So they have broad claims in this case. You heard me say at the beginning, one of the things that they're arguing is that this easement was extinguished or it was abandoned, so to say. And you heard me say at that time, don't be fooled by that argument. Right? We are not talking about extinguishment. We are not talking about abandonment of an easement. The judge is going to instruct you on the law, but when we talk about the law, um, again, we've got a written, recorded easement agreement. It's defense Exhibit 1. You get to see it too. I'm real sorry. It's, it's small print, um, but you can read it. When we have this written document, the problem we have here is that we don't, it's not merely what the defendant, what the Andersons want to argue to you is that they didn't use it. There was non-use. There's no use of this easement. We don't like your, your concept that somebody may enjoy this natural buffer. There's no use. The problem with that is that you cannot abandon an easement like this merely for non-use. The law is abundantly clear. It's got to be unequivocal, decisive abandonment. That would be Mrs. Darby saying, I abandoned easement too. We certainly did not hear that from her, right? I mean, Mrs. Darby was real clear. She enjoyed it for its natural state. Her husband walked through it. She had a wedding in her backyard, enjoyed the privacy it gave. There's no decisive action. She also talked about the fact that on two separate occasions, folks had asked to purchase that easement too. She said no the first time, and she said no the second time. And what's important about that too, keep in mind, is that second time was right before the Andersons purchased. 
when the nine perks asked if the Darby's would sell easement too. She said, no, why would I do that? It's valuable. It's valuable to my property, right? It's a valuable right. I'm not gonna sell it. So don't be fooled here. This is not an extinguishment. This is not abandonment. And on top of that, again, we show you that when they purchased in 2018, and remember they bought from Ms. Nyker, real estate agent. She signed the deed saying, what I am conveying to you is subject to an easement agreement. Same easement agreement it was subject to when I bought it. That is what she conveyed in 2018 to the Andersons. You hold on one second, Garvey. I'm sorry. I no, no, would you, you like some water? I can't drink any You water. can't, sorry, I didn't know that was. <laughs> I'm sorry. You're a pet. So the Andersons bought it with notice in their deed, and then a year and a half later, my clients buy their property. Again, their deed explicitly referenced same easement agreement. You heard Miss Darby talk about the fact when she bought the property. And she bought it from the original, one of the original owners who entered into that easement agreement. And she said the same thing. When I bought this property, subject to the same easement agreement. Nothing has changed. This document has not been rescinded. It has not been modified. It has not been amended. And you need to pay attention to that because there is no evidence of that anywhere. <coughs> It appears that the evidence that they want to use <coughs> is, is this, what they call the trash heap, that a landscaper that the Nykerps used at some point in time dumped trash into this area. Again, don't be fooled. That is not, does not meet the standard of where we need to be. Let's talk about adverse possession. Because similarly, they have brought a claim for adverse possession. Claiming, again, if we look at what they call this trash heap, this landscaper who dumped yard waste, sounds like some materials, we heard about some railroad ties um, and some other materials into easement too, that that now has created this claim of adverse possession. What does adverse possession mean? Again, you're gonna hear from the judge. This is not adverse possession. To be adverse possession, it's got to be open. It's got to be hostile. It's got to be notorious. And so exclusive of a use that you defeat the use for which it would be otherwise. There is nothing notorious here. One. It's not like they went in, the Nykirks went in and fenced it off and said, hey, nobody can come in. It's not like when the Davids purchased it, there were a whole bunch, or and when the Nykirks had it, there were a whole bunch of no trespassing signs. And I should say, with their claim for adverse possession, what they're trying to say is that if we go back 20 years, there's been such an open, notorious, hostile, so exclusive of a use that it's obvious it's now ours. And again, this appears to be based on this concept that a landscaper dumped some stuff in there and that there was vegetation that had grown up, right? 
Let's break that down. <laughs> Ms. Neifert couldn't tell you exactly where in easement to this dumping occur, correct? She even indicated at some point in time that she was able to get there. She didn't walk the whole thing and she didn't know if maybe somebody walked in an area she couldn't see whether they were still using it. There's nothing about this landscape waste that's being dumped that's open, notorious, and would prevent somebody from otherwise using easement too, which can be used for any legal purpose whatsoever, right? What did Ms. Darby tell us? She defeated this immediately, right? To the contrary, there is nothing obvious and so hostile to use that would defeat our use of it. In fact, Ms. Darby, who lived there the whole time, the Nyferks lived there, said that she continued to use easement too for that natural buffer. She had that wedding in the backyard, the privacy that it afforded, and her husband, continued to walk easement too. You may recall she also mentioned visitors that came to the house that on occasion would park on West Andrews and use that area to come up. So there's nothing in the evidence that shows any adverse possession by that would benefit the Andersons in this case. And even more basic than that, we would bring you back. I don't need to repeat it, but we would bring you back to the deeds, what everybody purchased, right? 2018, we don't even, have, they say lawyers are bad at math and I will attest to my math skills are not the best, but we don't need to do a lot of math to know 2018 doesn't get us to the 20 years that we would need it, even if we could show some kind of open, notorious, hostile use, right? It's just not there. You bought in 2018, you bought subject to an easement agreement. And my clients bought in 2020, subject to that same easement agreement. So don't be fooled. I know you won't be, but don't be fooled by these claims. They also have claims for trespass. It appears that those claims deal with some workers that crossed the Anderson property, alleged. We've seen no photographs of that. You've heard the Anderson property has nine surveillance cameras on it, nine. Not a single footage of workers going across the Anderson property. And keep in mind also that this allegation is not the Davids. They don't have any evidence to show you that the Davids came on, trespassed onto their property, right? Unless they wanna say when Mr. David went and knocked on the door, you know, to talk about the trash, which, hopefully neighbors do, right? Go knock on the door. Um, that that's a trespass. I mean, certainly they're not gonna go down that road. But so we have these workers. We have no evidence that this happened. It's an allegation. There's no evidence of it. Nine cameras, not a single footage. There's also no evidence that the Davies controlled where those workers went. In fact, you heard Mrs. Dabin say, we didn't. But when we did learn that somebody alleged that they were doing this, we reached out to their boss to say, hey, make sure if you are doing, you know, parking on West Andrews, you know, that you use the easement. So there is simply no trespass. Nuisance, one of the claims that they brought the interference with a property right. So you're gonna get the law from the judge again. And what they're gonna argue, or at least what it appears that their case is based upon, is that my clients exercising their rights to use easement two 
have created a nuisance. Okay. They're going to talk about those property stakes that went up, those property lines that went up. I mean, you heard Mr. Dougie and you heard Hopkins on both of those as to why those are important. But I suspect that that's, they're going to point to those to say that's a nuisance. They're ugly. They, you know, interfere with our use and enjoyment. Remember, it's got to be an unreasonable interference with use and enjoyment. But I suspect that's what they're going to argue along with the equipment. Equipment that they call raggedy, rusty, molded. They're going to say, Hopkins, you heard from Hopkins, that his equipment and his activity out on easement two was a nuisance. Think about that. That would be your kids playing in your yard or an area where they're rightfully allowed to be now being called a nuisance. Be a problem for society in general because most of our kids, ideally, <laughs> are outside playing. And if now they're playing, it's just because your neighbor doesn't like it, maybe he doesn't like the cross, or maybe you know he prefers they play football. Is that now a nuisance? because I don't like it. So I caution you that this is not a nuisance situation. There's also a claim by the Andersons for attorney's fees. And one of the claims they are gonna make appears to be based on what they call bad faith. Bad faith, from a legal standpoint, the judge will tell you, pertains to bad faith in an underlying action. What Mr. Edwards and the Andersons are trying to do with this claim is manufacture a bad faith claim after they filed a lawsuit. And part of that is what you heard Mr. Edwards try to say was an effort to de-escalate. You heard me on the stand say, I believe that is a mischaracterization of what has transpired. But you don't have to listen to my words and you don't have to listen to his words. What transpired before all of that? Anderson's purchase with full knowledge of their easement agreement. A year and a half later, my client's purchase. After my client's purchase, the Anderson's clear. They install fence that they intend to install all the way down the easement lines and block off access. They put lighting in a tree on the easement. They put sod and have an intent to go all the way down that easement area where they cleared, easement area two. We know that not just because we have a landscape plan that shows that. We know it because there's a sprinkler head, you know, put a sprinkler head in again, that this is, there was an intent to what they were doing. So don't be fooled by this. Mr. Edwards may try to say to you, oh, well, hey, we were trying to de-escalate. That is not at all what was going on. Punitive damages. They brought a claim for punitive damages. Intent to harm. There's no evidence that my clients intended any harm to the Andersons. It's quite the contrary. You've heard them say over and over that we bought a property that gave us rights to these easement areas. We were 
merely exercising our easement rights. So it's not a punitive damages case where the Andersons are entitled to punitive damages. If anyone's entitled to them, it's the Davids. Let's talk about the, the evidence and the Davids claims. And I wanna be real clear again, that those are the claims I don't, I don't have the crystal ball of what Mr. Edwards will get up here and tell you. That is what I believe he's going to tell you. And again, I would say, don't buy it. There is no evidence on any of those claims to sustain them for the Andersons. The evidence in this case supports exactly what we told you at the very start of the case. We have an interference with these. Anderson's bought 2018, subject to the easement agreement. David's bought 2020, subject to the easement agreement. You heard all of that in evidence. You're gonna see documents. After the David's purchase their property, what do we have? We have interference with an easement right. You heard both Mrs. and Mr. David talk about why they purchased this property. And one of the reasons they purchased this property was that it had what you would call a selling point, right? It had this easement access. It had this easement agreement that gave them these rights and these rights to do anything, any legal purpose whatsoever, right? You can use it for any legal purpose whatsoever. You heard them both though talk at the start of, uh, in their testimony that when they purchased it, sure, there may be other thoughts like, hey, this is great because we could potentially put a driveway in. But you heard from both of them that the selling point, when they purchased it, what they enjoyed about it was that wooded area, that privacy, the same thing Miss Darby talked about, this privacy, this ability to have this area where it feels like, you know, you're, you're sheltered, you're set off from West Andrews, that you're in this little forest. That's what they enjoyed and that's what was immediately taken away from them. Andersons don't deny clearing. They also don't deny that they didn't ask or even notify the Davids before they did it. Interference with an easement. We also have the fencing. You heard the testimony about the fencing from Mr. David <clears throat> telling you how he encountered the worker and that the worker had already dug the post holes. We have Mr. Anderson admitting in his testimony Yes, I was going to extend it all the way down the line. We have the landscape plan that the Andersons had put together. It doesn't dispute that. It shows that the fence was going to go all the way down the line. And that there was going to be a fence on the West Andrews side. Interference with easement rights. There's a light. They don't deny putting up in the tree. Didn't ask, didn't even notify. It interferes with the easement. There's sodding and a sprinkler system. Now the sodding at this point, if you look at the photos, you'll see that it, it barely encroaches. And you heard the testimony um, <laughs> And you have the landscape plan, again, that shows that there was an intent to extend it further. And again, we know that because we've got a sprinkler head too. 
It's an interference with an easement right. But what's even more obvious and maybe upsetting are not necessarily the clearing, the clearing is extremely problematic. But these things I've talked to you about, they interfere with an easement, right? But what let's talk about what's even more upsetting, right? It's the yelling. <clears throat> I'm not going to go through all the terminology in this case. You and I know it's not neighborly talk. It's not the way we teach any of our children to speak. It's morally reprehensible. This is not the way people behave, and it shouldn't be. But those events, the yelling, the racial slurs, the conduct associated with that, Make no mistake about it, that is intended to intimidate and prevent and bully so that you are not using this easement right, so that you do not feel comfortable when you're out there. I want to make sure you know that I do not want you out there. And I don't want you comfortable in your use of it. And who did we hear that from? We heard it from Mrs. Davi. We heard it from Mr. Davi. But I think if you think back to Hopkins testifying on the stand, remember what he said about Meg, being I, out I, on the I, easement. I thought I was just and not that he hasn't. I was, I was beating the program. But the way he feels every time he's out there. That lingering in my head, right? that uncomfortableness. That is interference with an easement, right? It may not be the fence blocking off, but make no mistake, it's no different. It is an interference with an easement, right? And in this case, it's intentional and it's designed to have a specific impact. And you heard these folks saying it is. Mr. David testified that he would probably use the area more, but it's uncomfortable, doesn't want to. Mrs. David doesn't want to be out there, right? She goes out, she will pick up some stuff, but she's not feeling good about it. And she's restricting her use because of that, right? I don't want to be seen by this guy for fear that I may be on the receiving end of some unwanted aggravations again, some assaults, some yelling. So the conduct here is a clear pattern of interference with these easement rights. You're muted. Hi, Meg. How are you doing? Hey, good. This seems like an absolute disaster all around. Uh, I, I've not followed the entire saga, so is there any chance you can give me like the, fifth, the 30 second elevator pitch? Um, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, I just got- Am, am I coming in okay? Yeah. Oh, I have to turn that on. Everybody say hi to Jay Robine Law. If you um, are not familiar with Jay Robine Law, he uh, Good works over at the channel called Jay Robine Law. Every now and again. Sometimes and, um, I disappear for a while, but I always have a tendency to come back. Okay. So the Andersons purchased a property and when they purchased that property, let's see. Oh, it's going to make me share my whole. Window. My understanding was that there were two easements that became problematic. Yeah. 
I'm gonna. I'm trying to pull up a picture. It's just not letting me. It's, it's okay. Oh, okay. So here is the. So eleven and twelve right here on the screen. Mm -hmm. That's the two properties. Okay. And there is an easement right down here. Eh, it's not letting me color. It usually lets me color. Okay. Is that for right like, down a, here at the bottom. Is that like for a driveway to West Avenue? Yes. This is um, Andrews Road. And up okay. here is Habersham. So th the David's house is up here. They have a, and there's another easement right here. That's a, um, a pad, a, a brick pad. Oh. Okay. Hey, Hi. Jeff. Welcome. Yes. Hello. So in this brick pad is where they park, but this is technically on the Anderson's property. Okay. And so it started when Anderson's moved in, they cleared this portion of it, and this is still all wooded. Okay. But there's a, an agreement, an easement agreement from back in the 90s, giving this owner permission to use this as a parking pad, which makes sense. Yeah. I mean, because it's paved and part of their driveway. Uh, they're trying to claim that they also get that new development. Well, That's right here, easy. this is, this is, there's also an easement agreement for this. Okay. And it's a very vague easement agreement. It says they can do whatever they want as long as it's legal. So okay. that is, so right. the, the issue went, both of them thought that they should have exclusive rights to it. The Davids thought that they, should have the right to do whatever they wanted with it. And the Andersons were not allowed on it. And the Andersons thought they should be able to do what they wanted with it. As long as, you know, they had and, access. And what state is this? Georgia. It's Georgia. There's, there's actually. Okay. So it runs laws that say law. you can't, you can't restrict an owner from accessing their property. It went up to the court of appeals who, there was that motion for summary judgment, uh, partial summary judgment in favor of the Davids that was appealed and ruled in favor of the Andersons. That is, that is the one, that would be the Southern Moore property where yes. they did the improvements. They ruled in favor that it, the easement didn't run in the way that the northern war property uh thought it should right, I, right? yeah okay. that they can't they can't exclude the actual owner of the property from use of it and that's what they were wanting to do okay and but, so then they went with a adverse possession argument that's yeah but that's part of it that they're throwing that's, that's everything. That's what I'm hearing, and I apologize. I was on the phone. I had, I have a job interview next Monday, and I was trying to set up the dinner. That's exciting. Well, yeah. there's still more. So he called her a fat B. So she, um, filed a TPO against him. Okay. I mean, Good puppies. Not good on either side, but so be it. So apparently he called them the Algerian inwards, which she proudly sat on the stand and said multiple times. She just okay. kept saying All it over right. and over again. I'm like, okay, could you stop? I'm tired of editing it out. So we were looking at it and um, I'm not sure if you know Big Tiff dog, Big Tiff and her dog. I think oh, we might have met once, but I don't think that we really know each other all that well. Right. She is actually but a my property to meet you, John. Expert. I've, definitely seen, I've definitely seen you in chat over the years. <laughs> right, right. So she did some digging into um, this last night. We were talking and we're like, why would somebody give up 
like usage of their land in such awkward places. Like if you don't want it, give it to them, you know? So you want to tell us what you found? Yeah. So, uh, uh, yeah, I'm actually a, <clears throat> a certified property nerd, <laughs> um, in title insurance for 30 years, but what happened, what I believe happened based on my review, because I went back in the chain for both lots way back. And Martha Smith started this whole mess. Like she originally owned those two lots. And the older house sits on the lot that the um, David's house is on right now, or that, that they own. And she, that's what she lived in for a long time. She then split them back into lots 11 and 12. And built a new house on the Anderson's property. When she did that, she still lived in that uh, David home. So she carved out those pieces for her benefit. Right. Right. And then at some point, I think this was her retirement plan. I think way too much about what these people are doing when they're doing these things. But uh, she, she ended up moving into the Anderson home and selling the David home. Okay. Uh -huh. And she originally deeded, deeded those pieces that are now easements to that owner that's been in the gap between them and the Davids. Right. Okay. Uh, she realized her mistake, I think, <laughs> and attempted to correct it in a really bad way because she, like the legal descriptions are completely messed up now in the easement agreement. Um, mm -hmm. But the, if you're just looking superficially at it and not exact boundary lines, it is pretty, pretty. So, uh, let me, uh, I, I'm sorry. I don't mean to hijack you show Meg. No, you're fine. But a uh, big tip dog. It, would you like to explain how, legal divisions or legal descriptions are very, very much relevant in terms of the defeasement of property. Oh yeah, that's the point. Um, they're very, very, very important uh, down to the second of um, travel when you're explaining uh, a mapping out a piece of property, right? It, it goes by degrees and, and time as far as i think as... i have that the chart you probably the yeah, northwest, they go, they go northwest, degrees, northwest. Minutes, let me see if i can pull that up Generally, i just learned yeah. that i was my mind was blown well, <laughs> I, was like, I never knew what a legal description meant this is why i wanted to ask the question because yes a legal description is usually speaking in any sort of say for instance mortgage agreement that is exhibit a Mm -hmm. And it goes down to degrees, minutes, and seconds on how you actually pace the property. Yep. Yeah. And so you'll see terms like rods and chains and links and all that. They're, they're basically just different ways of saying um, space, right? Dis distance, I should say. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about the fact that this Martha Smith originally deeded a, a chopped up piece of lot 12 and all of lot 11 to the person that she sold that old house to the older house to uh she she did that for her own benefit because she lived in that older house at the time and it made sense but then when she thought hey i'm gonna live in this other house and i actually want more of that to my value right yes <laughs> value so she wants more she wants the value of that um those two notches added to her piece so that she can sell that at maximum value, which she ultimately did a, a few years later. So then she granted the easements instead of carving them out. Well, and that's, that's one of the things that I always want to just make clear. And I apologize for cutting you off. I will <laughs> let you finish your thought. Um, is people need to know that property law is the oldest of the five branches of law it is the oldest one and it is in many ways the most arcane uh so the five branches of law for those who would like to learn property contract constitutional criminal and tort and 
I think I had that pretty much in line in terms of how old all of them are. But yeah. um yeah, property is the oldest form of law that we have. Yep, and I'm a huge nerd for it. Um <laughs> but that and I really enjoy I, it. I started as a paralegal for a foreclosure firm before I went to law school. Oh, so I actually do work for a foreclosure firm right now. So yeah, it's a yeah, that I may have something to do that, but uh, and maybe I didn't, but yeah. That's okay, we'll get back to the really slow talking lawyer in a second, but you know, every once in a while, I have to teach you something, like because I just learned oh, it. I'm so I'm gonna tell you. So when you buy a house or whatever, you have the 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 really long description where it talks about your northwest of northwest, south one half whatever with all those things that I have no freaking idea what it says it's just a bunch of words it means nothing to me do you want to there explain means, it to there and bounds yeah that, that's exactly right, but nobody really understands what they are i do but it, <laughs> who hasn't worked in property law well it's <laughs> telling you where you're going what like the whole world is like a big grid and it's narrowing it down and every time it narrows it down it takes a square and it divides that square into half and then quarters and then those get halves and then the quarters yep all the way down to sort of what tip was just saying with the seconds they and it, so you got to think of it as starting out at the you know the the larger grid the over you know the oversized grid that if you think of it across man i wish i could pull up I have a map it's kind of neat it shows the whole united states grid but um the and then it just narrows in oops, sorry it just narrows in farther and farther uh so you start out like in like for example in illinois there's meridian and and you describe how far away from the meridian you line you are are you on the east or the west of it and yeah there's there's, there's in, in new york we use chains yep and so they start you know they start uh in michigan we have a baseline and uh, uh meridian so um we have like a little cross down in this. Um, so, oh, so can I'll, you I'll, explain I'll that? Example. I'll give one real quick example, if I may. My ancestral family home is on a little bit more than an acre on Long Island, but it's three separate tax lots, <laughs> only two of which actually have external access. So the third tax lot could not be sold without selling one of the other ones. Yep. Because otherwise, you're never going to get a certificate, of, a certificate of occupancy. So that's a good point because you can't sell a landlocked property. You can't sell a property that doesn't have access. Correct. That's so okay, so let's tie that back in. Yep. You have three properties. The driveway's on the first one, mm -hmm. and you have people on either side of you and in the back of you. So you have two lots behind that there's no road access to. Mm -hmm. What are your options? You have to have a right of an easement. Allow you have your, to have an easement. Rent, That's rent, what easements are usually used for. And rent, easement. Right of way and easement used um, like in the same context. It, it's yeah. pretty, same context. It's just different phrasing. Well, and the, the question at the end of the day from a property law perspective is, does that easement attach to the property or does it attach to the contract that granted the easement? And that's where you end up with a lot of dispute. And that's where the the the, the state law and, and how it has evolved over time is important because every state can vary, obviously. And uh it depends on whether what the what the Supreme Court of that state, which is what we've talked a lot about in this case, um, determines uh or and I'm I'm always gonna be a stickler in this one. In New York, it's the Court of Appeals. Yeah, yeah. In Michigan, we go and Court of Appeals, and then Supreme. Right. Yeah. So the question is, does it run? So the way that we do, the way that it's described in Florida is, does it run with the land or does it run with the contract? And you can contract your way around it to some extent where it's like as long as you're still my neighbor i can use this but yeah this has right it running with the land yeah and so it makes it perpetual to that point and and i think it even has the phrase perpetual in it i know i sent it yes. to you 
um, it's one agreement, but it encompasses two easements. But uh, to that point, so like you said, it's the oldest form of law, but it's also a little bit of the wild, wild west in terms of what you put into the agreement. It's what the parties agree to at the time, right? And, and but, but that's, that's where running with the land becomes very different because, and this is when you're doing a closing, for instance, and I've done a couple of those, you okay. have to understand what are the covenants that are baked into the property. And there are some states that like the idea of baking covenants into the property itself, as opposed to having it more on the contractual side. Yep. So by the deed over time. Okay. Right. We still got two more closings to get through. So. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I didn't <laughs> go down the rabbit hole. You could go on for hours. So my, I just wanted to get through that Martha Smith really, 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 really did this in. Yeah. But, it, it's an odd one. I think the entire I think they could make an entire argument on the fact that the the that the easement agreement itself is invalid because it's inaccurate. I agree with you. Yeah, I think they're missing a whole argument that they, they probably I, don't I, I, realize. I'm actually because... going to step further and said that it over encumbered the property to the point that it's basically worthless. But the legal yeah. description's inaccurate too. Yep. Yep. It's bad. So I'm surprised they haven't argued that, but they probably haven't figured it out. A lot, of, a lot of attorneys don't even do title searches before they go to court, which blows my mind. But I trust sometimes me. I, the internet the collective the is smarter. Title insurance drives me absolutely insane. <laughs> so coming up next is actually the attorney that is handling the counterclaim. So the Andersons brought this action against the Davids. The Davids turned around and filed a counter petition back against the Andersons. So there is a second attorney. There's three. I don't know what the third one's for. He hmm. almost looks like he's falling asleep, but um, the woman everybody's is handling. Everybody's, everybody's got to pay the rent, right? Yeah. So she's focused on the counterclaim. So she's basically defending the Andersons as opposed to attacking them for those specific things. So. Oh, so she's like their attorney in the counterclaim as plaintiffs but she's there's a different attorney for them as defendants in the original she's court? the attorney for them in the counterclaim as defendants and uh, um, oh edwards is the attorney for them in the initial claim as plaintiffs okay okay yeah and the fact that they're never on the screen <sighs> yeah that's gonna drive you nuts yeah all right so this there was 20 minutes of silence in the stream it just was there and then it went straight into um mrs met met something's closing describe their backyard a secret garden and we saw we saw a couple pictures of their backyard it's gorgeous um, right. it's beautiful. beautiful a secret garden well uh, a dumping ground for yard clippings, trash, rotten wood, plastic bottles, place where venomous snakes live. Is that a secret garden? No, they weren't the same. And you don't have to take my word for that. I went through every single plant that David Shostak saw in the green area. And it was on the screen the whole time. You could see for yourself, it was the David's backyard. It was randomly picked because Ms. Sturm told him it was similar. And I went through every plant. We talked about it and I asked every <laughs> single time, is that native to Georgia? Is that native to Georgia? Is that native to Georgia? No, 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 no. And I even asked one of them, I said, is that the, the old English ivy? Is that considered invasive? He said, yes. Uh, so they weren't similar. And I even asked, I said, you wouldn't know if the random area that you've picked had ever been landscaped, would you? And he said, well, actually, yeah, I would. 
oh, really? How? And he said, well, because of all the plants that we just talked about. And I said, right, because they're not native to Georgia. And he said, right. Well, here's something that we all know. And of course, everything I'm, everything I'm pointing out uh, is, is in evidence, things that you heard. Eastman area two had never been landscaped. You heard from Miss Nykirk, you heard from Miss Darby, you heard from the Andersons. Everybody who, who's owned that property or lived next to it for a period of time, Miss Nykirk mm -hmm. never used it. No, nope. except for a dumping ground. Sure, yeah, I dump, I dump stuff in there. I think she even said she let her neighbors dump stuff in there. Mrs. Darby said, I never planted anything in there. No, absolutely not. I never planted anything in there. Uh, it had never been professionally landscaped. So everything in easement area two was native to Georgia. It was, and I believe Miss Nykirk described it as wild. Uh, it was wild and it was wild to Georgia. So asking for $87,000 worth of landscaped plants that just happened to be in the David's backyard is completely and totally unreasonable. That's, that's, that's not a replacement cost. Um, and to that point, uh, since the secret garden was such a drawing, uh, you know, exciting thing for Mrs. David, it's interesting that there's such an issue with clearing out an area that was full of weeds, trash, rotten wood, poison ivy, plastic bottles, venomous snakes. Seems like you'd be happy that, that that's gone now. <clears throat> Another thing about the clearing and we heard testimony from, from Mr. David at some point in time, I believe the exact date was August 12th, 2021. He did some clearing for himself and he's meant to for his path. Seems like that was okay. He needs to clear something. No problem. I asked, did you talk about the Andersons with that? No. Um, okay. Um, so I guess if they want to clear, I don't know. Uh, and one last thing, they talked about a driveway and Mr. David said, well, we've never, we've never, you know, we've talked about it, but we never put any real plans together for the driveway. Uh, so that's not really something that we've seriously talked about doing. And Mrs. David said that it was enticing for her. So it was enticing for her. So if the driveway was ever going to go there, probably have to keep clear easement too, especially of all that trash and stuff. So <clears throat> the big one, interference with easement too. And of course, and Ms. Sturm told you when she was talking about conversion, which was, you know, the vegetation and everything, she kind of said, well, even if you don't find that, um, you know, that could go to interference. And one reason about that is when you hear the law on conversion, Part of that is because you have to own the property that you're claiming was converted. Well, we know from evidence in this case that the people who own easement to, that's the Andersons. They're paying taxes on it. They own it. They're, they're the property owners. So they own that property. Um, so <clears throat> uh, that's a difficult road on conversion. So Let's talk about some other interferences. Again, I, I can't say enough. Communication is really key. If you don't want someone to interfere with what you're doing, you got to tell them what you want to do. It doesn't have to be a long conversation, just a check in. Hey, here's what we're planning on doing. Please, you know, now you know. So that's what we're going to do. But that communication never happened. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> Let's go ahead and discuss their main allegation with interference on easement area two. The things that they're claiming Mr. Anderson has said. 
and death. One of them we know is true. Mr. Anderson got up on the stand and said on February 24th, or February 21st, 2020, or February 24th, I'm sorry, 2021, there was an unfortunate exchange with Mrs. David. Now you heard some differing testimony about that. Mr. Anderson gave you some context as to what was going on that day. Um, <clears throat> the the um, guys were laying down some sod on the Anderson's uh, portion of the property and Mrs. David told him to stop. Don't you lay that sod down, that's easement area too. It wasn't. And she claims that was a nice conversation. I don't know. Um, but that got back to Mr. Anderson. He found out. And then at some point in time, she came back. And that's when the exchange happened. Now, Mr. Anderson has admitted, you know, she got under my skin. She told my workers to stop doing the work I'm paying them for. And then she called me a bad person. And then she started talking about my marriage. And that just kind of pushed his buttons. And he said, I shouldn't have said it. I've apologized. I regret it. I shouldn't have said it. He admitted that he was wrong for saying that. According to Mrs. DeVee, she said nothing at all. This is totally unprovoked. That's a credibility issue. You're going to have to decide where you think the truth on that, if, it, 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 if that portion of this matters to you. But here's what we know happened next, what I think is very telling for the rest of what we're going to talk about. After that exchange, the February 24th, 2021 incident. The Andersons I'm going to hijack this for a second. And I know Meg's going to be mad at me. And I hope that she will forgive me. But for the love of God, this is absolutely outside the realm of anything that is ever willing, ever reasonable as the rules of evidence. It's absolutely beyond the pale. And I apologize. I did that. And if you would like to not invite me in the future, I can understand that as well. It's okay. Got a cease and desist letter. So, wait, hold on. Which was so that was, it was actually a, a point I was looking at. I know you haven't seen any of this trial. Um, dumpster, I, I had a dumpster that was on fire that would just randomly, you know, go across the screen because that's what this I, is. I, I, I just couldn't help myself. Oh, I'm sorry, Tiff. So the the one point she was just making, it, to me, should have been a much bigger deal. That's where everything started. That was that was where the breakdown that happened. Be your closing that was the first argument. thing that was really wrong. That should have been an evidentiary discussion much further forward in the course of the trial well these are closing arguments i know and but, it couldn't be left to closing arguments i mean they they did talk about it during the trial some but the when she told them to the workers to stop with the sod that's when things should have ended. been handled right there because i agree she with was you trying to exclude the Andersons from using that. And I think where I'm getting caught up is the Andersons were building a fence, but if they put a gate in the fence, which we don't know, because the only evidence of them building a fence was somebody saying that there was holes dug all the way down, then that's still not, that's not preventing them from accessing it. And I, I, I will say, honestly, I have not seen the entire trial. So Karen Blank said that it was addressed during the course of the trial. But that drives me absolutely insane. And that's why I decided to take the pause. And maybe the two of you can convince me otherwise, but... And there I, are rules where opening and closing arguments are just that. They are arguments. They're not presenting evidence. But right. The easement they, can be closed off. First found out that there was really an issue saying, with the 
that it no. as long as they still have access to it i i i i that's touchy it's that's touchy it would if i'm the beneficiary of the easement i wouldn't want a fence across the easement right so if they close it off and the david say i don't want that then they can say what their intended purpose of using it is and then the court is going to make them take the fence down mm -hmm. and they're going to make the but they have to have a purpose they have to have a use if they're just going to use it for the ball the lacrosse practice in the backyard well the fence doesn't affect that thing in any way um as far as like the i don't know that i necessarily agree with that they're I not restricting access Again, the issue is not restricting access, but the issue could be that it lowers the value of the property. And that is not an uncognizable legal harm. I think that the biggest problem is, is the Davids never expressed an intended use. Had they expressed an intended use, then you could say, well, they were trying to do this and you prevented them from doing it. I want to build a road. Well, you put a log in there so we couldn't do that. You know, there, but there was no intended use. It was like, we want it. We want it to be ours and we're going to do whatever we want with it. Yeah, that, that, the, the, the whole genesis, the, the easement agreement is worded horribly. I agree. And, and very one-sided and it really does restrict, it restricts a lot even if it's not allowed to it restricts so until it's challenged you can't you can't approach any of those things and the words are so subject like they're, they're so vague well what you're essentially doing and the way that they structured the easement agreement is for lack of a better term Unless you just leave this as woodlands, I own a third of your property. Yeah. And you know, fight me. I really think it was just done for financial gain before she deuced out of lot 12 and, or yeah, 12 before she sold it and said, I'm out and I want to get the most out of this before I leave. That's yeah. bad. She didn't think. So, so it's like, I'm going to devise this into two properties. I'm gonna split them in half, and uh, you know I'm just gonna add an easement that runs with the land. That means that whoever buys it, they get an extra third of the property. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if there was, um, you know, some places have rules that you have to have so much property per house, and she didn't want to give all the property to the second lot. Generally speaking, outside of New York City, you have to have a quarter of an acre. I don't know exactly what the rules are when it comes to Florida. It's different in every city. It, yeah, same here in Michigan, at least. And I tried to find the restrictions on this property and could not. Mm. Um, it's um through the city of Atlanta. Clearing up the weeds and stuff. And what? Oh, when I touch my earbud it plays the video okay so yep let's go i mean I all can, of that that's perfect. that's when they first found out um and they, the letter said stop everything on eastman area two or we're going to put a lien on your property it's pretty threatening um so they got that letter also mrs david called the police on uh, mr anderson that day so she called the police on february 24th 2021 on february 26 2021 they get the cease and desist letter and then two weeks later she files a temporary protective order on him and this is all related to that that interaction between mr anderson and mrs david on february 24th 2021 that's how all of that was addressed so <clears throat> let's go to the, there was an allegation that Mr. Anderson had a gun in front of uh, Hopkins to be. Well, now we know through testimony, uh, Mr. Anderson told you and Hopkins to took the stand and told you 
The gun was in a case. It was in a sealed case. He wasn't pointing a gun at a kid. That simply didn't happen. And Mr. Anderson said, well, there was, a, you know, one day where I can remember that I had gone to the shooting range. I had the gun in a sealed case. I took it from the car. I put it in the gun safe. I didn't know he was out there. And, you know, Hopkins debuted said, well, it was in a case. So we know it was in a case. We know it's not this man waving a gun at a kid. Um, and you know what didn't happen? Police weren't called. Temporary protective order wasn't filed. That's going to go to credibility, and that's going to be something for y'all to think about. Another allegation was the surveillance camera to the Debbie's uh, daughter's room. Well, I mean, of course, you know, Mr. Anderson testified what the surveillance cameras are, where they're pointed um, at entryways in their house, and but they're not surveilling the Debbie's. And what didn't happen when Mrs. David believes that uh, a camera was pointed at the window? No calling the police, no temporary protective order. Um, and certainly for these last two involving your kids, I, I would imagine if you, if these were, if this is what you really believed, if this was serious, you would handle them accordingly. Um, but none of that happened. And then, uh, the racial slur allegation, which happened, they say, twice. Also, no call to the police, no temporary protective order. This is all going to go to credibility because how they acted on February 24th, 2021, you could certainly draw the conclusion that they would have acted exactly the same for all of these other incidents if they did in fact happen. And of course, as it relates to this case, because one of the things that you should ask yourself as you're going through the evidence is, why did I hear this? What does this mean for this case? Because remember what you're deciding. Was there a material interference with easement rights? Did any of this stop them from using the easement? I no. swear to God, Meg. If, In if, fact, I actually. I apologize. I'm hijacking your stream. But what the fuck are you talking about? Because if you genuinely don't know why am I hearing this, then you shouldn't have heard it. The fact that you heard it is the basis of just simple evidence. Why is this happening? In their closing arguments, they're literally saying, well, you heard some stuff that maybe you shouldn't have. Yeah, no, the reason why you heard it is because of the rules of evidence. I just, am, am I totally insane? I, this I, whole it, case is, is kind of like this. So you need to just take a deep breath and just roll with it. It This is not, this is like um, my cousin Vinny in with preschoolers. But here's the point that I want to make, and I want to make it very quickly. And I will make it okay. I Stop. Show. None of this should ever happen. You should never have to ask to yourself, why did I hear this evidence? Because otherwise, the opposing counsel would not have had you heard this evidence. Or you're a really shit lawyer and you let evidence be told to the jury that shouldn't have in the first place. Those are your two options. I don't think she was necessarily saying it was like against the rules shouldn't have been. It just that it was. Love the pups. But yeah, 
anything that is actually said and uttered in court is evidence. Period. Bar none. That's just the way that it works. And your job, generally speaking, as a defense attorney, is to not let them say that. And so the fact that they did, and you're now trying to roll it back in your closing arguments, sorry, that's too little too late. You can't unring a bell. You should watch a little bit of it just, you know, to rile you up a bit, because it, it basically was five days of um, high school petty nitpicking, talking about they threw something in our dumpster and it, it just, it, it, it was ridiculous. Like there, there was, there was no evidence that was substantial in any way. And it should have been something that we're looking at a contract and we're deciding what it was, but they tacked on all these other charges for um, conversion and trespassing and all this and made it into something it's and not. So they have this the argument that I wanted to make, but we were listening to closing arguments about conversion. Because that actually was a halfway decent argument. She I apologize. Failed. Somebody <laughs> came to my door and they went nuts. She failed dismally at the conversion argument, but that actually was probably the best ar the best defense arguments that you possibly had. And she failed at that. I don't know that there was 20 minutes of argument after that. It could have just been a, a long pause. No, set that aside. That's totally okay. The conversion argument, because yes, this most is the this is the big thing. What that, that is legally? Go ahead. Sorry. No, yes, and then you can do that. The biggest thing is this, and Lisa, you are incorrect. The David sent a cease and desist letter to the Andersons telling them that they could not step foot on that property. And they also threatened a lien and other things. And that is what the issue is. That is what the issue is. They were trying to prevent the Andersons from use of their property. The Andersons are the legal owners of the ground. And the Davids have usage of it. They don't own it. They have usage of it. So that it's two different things and you can't exclude either one of them. Go ahead, Tiff. I think Tiff probably can explain the yeah, you... concept better than either of I can, uh, either of us can. Yeah. And, and to be honest, I should have thought of an explanation before we started all of this, but it, so there's, there's two concepts in property law, um, I shouldn't say concepts. There's when you own your property, you're called a fee simple owner. You're the the owner of the property, the land, etc. Now, to from, be hell, from heaven to hell. <laughs> right. Um, that is the hell, term. Eh, yeah. Sort of, unless you're Maybe talking about uh, you know water rights and <laughs> you know fluid yeah. rights, but but. The idea is I that did actually go to law school. an easement cannot interfere with your fee simple rights. Um, to 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 the uh, <laughs> and not it's early. not right to the extent that it's not allowed to by law, right? So most of the time you can contract around it, right? And I'm going to mute you if you keep interrupting her. <laughs> All right, I'll put up. it. Okay, around it, and I've said this multiple times because my favorite boss in the world said it you can put anything in a contract it doesn't make it legal so just because the easement agreement is worded a certain way that does not mean that the terms of that agreement are legal so that's why it's being litigated to be honest it, it's worded poorly it's worded in favor of one party more than the other and you can't necessarily do some of the things that i believe you can't necessarily do some of the things that it says you can well, I think one of the things is the person who created it created it for their own personal benefit mm -hmm. because they were living in that house. Mm -hmm. And no one living in that house is ever going to agree to dissolve it. No. I mean, 
I guess somebody may be able to buy them out, but it would take an absorbent amount of money. I mean, to the extent like it, it includes the ability of the beneficiary to build structures <laughs> on the property that would essentially be taxed against the other property. It's, it's, I won't use all the legal mumble jumbo, but it's a. The owner or the defeaser. And that is challenging. <laughs> right. I'm allowed to speak now. Go ahead. So, generally speaking, and I think Diff Dog would agree that the way that you look at property, particularly under a legal kind of microscope, is it's sort of a bundle of rights. You have a handful of sticks and some of those you can sell off and keep others. So fee simple is I have everything. Then you can offer an easement, which is I'm going to give you two of the sticks, but I'm going to keep the other 12. About right. Yeah, and so that's why you'll see, I would say, in, in more deeds than not, uh, uh, several um, percent, large percentage of the deeds will say, subject to existing easements, building and use restrictions, and anything else of record, right? So then it's on you, the buyer, to find out what those restrictions and easements may be. Uh, however, in both of the deeds, to the Davids and the Andersons, that easement was specifically called out. They cannot claim they were not aware of it. It was specifically called out in both deeds. Well, because Probably because it's such a big deal. I mean, that should have devalued the Anderson's property significantly. Mm -hmm. Like if they really understood right. what the implications were, they probably didn't because it had never been used. And if someone's like, nobody's ever done anything, they're not going to do anything with it, you know, whatever. Yeah, and I think they didn't expect... I think that's why the abandonment argument yesterday yeah. was interesting as well. I, I don't. I, I actually did not think the abandonment argument was fantastic. I did go back and I looked at some of that before today. Um, the abandonment argument is a little bit challenging, uh, just because one, I don't think that there was actually abandonment of the easements. No. Because it was still being used. The the abandonment argument was interesting, but I don't think accurate. So it, it was it it the it was revived every time a deed was recorded and it was referenced. And I mean referenced generally or specifically. So well, it can't be abandoned in that sense from a legal standpoint, right? Yeah. Um, and I'll, I'll give you, I'll give an example just because uh, sorry. We I don't I, have I, time for examples. We gotta get through this video because we still have like another hour's worth, okay? Before we right. get to the verdict. Wait, can, I, can I get one minute? That's all I'm asking. No, because you've interrupted three times and we were supposed to wait till the end. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. Pause till the next break. It's, 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 area two it's your show. It's before your the Davids moved in. We don't even have to sit there because we know that's also true. Who else told us? That easement two was wooded when the Davi when that Davids purchased their property. Mrs. Darby. Mrs. Darby told us easement two was wooded. So don't get distracted. Don't bite. Let's talk about the statement Miss Medwick made. Every time we did something and they asked us not to do it, we stopped. That is a very generous way to characterize that. We cleared. We didn't ask permission. We didn't notify. It's already done. Sure, we didn't do any more, but we did it. The fence. Put it up. We were going to go further. Mr. David had to talk to the worker. Hey, we've got an easement. Please don't do that. And what they're telling you is, oh, we stopped. 
That's not what happened. The trash, they say, we didn't do it again. We stopped. Told us we didn't like it, we stopped. What they're doing here is they're saying to you, we didn't notify you about any of these. We didn't ask permission to do any of these. And now we're coming to you and saying, it was fine for us to do it. And, and we are now seeking your forgiveness for what we did. There are no pictures of these snakes, of this trash heap. But also, if it is such a mess that they complain about, this is Buckhead. Somebody in this neighborhood would have called City of Atlanta and said, we need somebody out here to tell us that we've got a helicopter here. There is no evidence of that. None. Certainly, in Buckhead, if there was a problem, there would have been some action. There would have been that notice. They don't have that. So these aren't, we did these things and we stopped every time they asked us to. Make no mistake about that. That is very much, we did them, we're now seeking your forgiveness. But don't forget what happened after that, right? So now we're just gonna start filming you constantly. And we're not just filming you, but we're intimidating you while we're doing it. And we're yelling at you while you're doing it. The racial slurs that we talked about. Yeah, we're not gonna say them again. They're morally reprehensible. Two times, Mrs. David Hopkins both testified that this happened. The second time that it happened, there's testimony that both the Anderson son-in-law, who they tossed under the bus on the trash, and the daughter were there. Why were they not called? There's no rebuttal. They know these things were said. They're trying to distract. They want to say, why didn't you call the police? They criticize them when they do call the police, and they criticize them when they don't call the police. There's a lawsuit. They're in the midst of a lawsuit right now. Mr. Shostak. Mr. Shostak didn't just testify. You remember, he's got the blue area. He's got the green area that is, is comparable and the red area that's clear. He didn't just testify that, oh, this is just what the back of the David property looks like because somebody planted it. He said, yes. I did look at other areas. Yes, it's consistent with the pattern in these other areas. So it's not just like, oh, somebody created a secret garden that stayed just on the David property. No, it's consistent with other areas. And you can look to his green box that he has. You can see it, it kind of tips over the um, property line. So it's on both the David and the Anderson property. And again, you heard him say that some of the vegetation had started to grow back in that area that was cleared. So it's not just some plantings that were done on somebody's property for a particular reason. This is what the woods look like in that area. Um. You had testimony about the equipment and the stoves and whatnot. They want to now make a big deal that there were no pictures. They didn't refute when Hopkins testified to those. They did not rebut that. He told you what happened. There's no need for pictures. So I just want to remind you, and I don't get the last word. And you heard Ms. Medwick, what she was telling you is, Casey, don't get up, right? Don't get up. Um, but I want to remind you is that this isn't about the last word. I do agree with her on this is common sense. You've heard the testimony. Why is she saying actions speak louder than words right now? It's because we know the words that have been used in this case. 
and we know the impact of those words, and we know what it was intended and designed to do, and we know that it did in fact do that. And she says, well, they still use the easement area. No, there has been evidence that yes, people are still going out there. What did they all tell you? Mr. David, I would use it more, but I don't like it, it's uncomfortable. Even Hopkins, who goes out there the most, said about the way it me makes him feel when he's out there. It's uncomfortable. It's always lingering in my mind. I've got to be on guard. Is that how you should act when you're using what is rightfully yours to use? So that is a clear material interference with easement rights. So again, just in closing, it's not about the last word. Use your common sense. You have heard all the evidence in this case. And I trust that you can do it. Thank you for your time. All right, um, that would be our plan. Um, when you are ready, Mr. Edwards, you can begin. All right. Uh, thank you, Judge. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I know y'all want to get out of here desperately. We want this case over. Believe me, we we all want this case over. And the way to do that, I'm going to walk through the jury charges, not in great detail. I'm going to show you what to do on the verdict form to bring closure to this dispute. And the number one way to bring closure is to find in our favor and extinguish this easement. Because if this easement continues to exist, we're going to be here again and again and again. We all know it. We all know it. I want to, I want to respond to a few things that Ms. Stern said. And one thing that she's, well, the first thing she said was, case involves an easement, but the one piece of evidence they didn't introduce was the easement. Well, the reason for that is simple. As Judge McBurney will tell you, construction of this easement is an issue of law for him. It's not your job to read that easement, try to figure out what it means. It's his job. He's going to tell you what the easement means. And Ms. Sturm also said this, and I don't know if it was an intentional pause or just, just a pause. But she told you, the judge is going to charge you and she paused. There is no adverse possession. That's not what he's going to charge you. He's going to charge you that whether there was adverse possession for 20 years is for you to decide. Not Casey Stern, not the judge, not me. That's an issue of fact for the jury. Y'all get to make that decision. He's also going to charge you this on the issue of abandonment. Ms. Sturm said something along the lines of, there's no such thing as abandonment by mere non-use, no matter how long it is. But what Judge McBurney is going to tell you the law is, is that for adverse possession, there is a, excuse me, for abandonment, there is a presumption of abandonment based on non-use for 20 years. It can be rebutted, but there is a presumption. And by my math, 1996 to 2020 is more than 20 years. So we have those few things. I also want to kind of respond to one, one thing that has been In response to, you know, our joke around the office, what do you call people who threaten a lawsuit? You call them a defendant. Well, what Ms. Sturm wants you to think is that I'm the reason we're here. She wants you to think that they were just trying to get along. And then all of a sudden, the Anderson's lawyered up. She refers to an email that he sent in October. Anderson's are lawyering up. 
you're going to get all these exhibits, including my attorney's fees, and you're going to see my very first entry, March 26, 2021, after the TPO had been served on Tracy Anderson. That's my first entry. You're also going to get their attorney's fees. That big old, it's this one right here, this big old thick thing right here, Defendant's Exhibit 35. And you're going to get to look through those and do all sorts of cipher. The very first entry by Ms. Sturm is January 4th, 2021. January 4th, 2021. And then this is very interesting. You know, sometimes, most of the time, we've done all this discovery, depositions and documents, and we know all the facts. Sometimes lawyers get surprised during a trial. I got surprised because I got that exhibit as Mr. Shostak was taking the stand. And I was going through it with my highlighter and my little sticky flag. This is interesting. If I'd have known this on Monday, it would have been in my timeline, believe me. February 22nd, 2021. Receive, review, and respond to email communications from JND, Jean Noel David. Something's going on here. Something's going on. Something is going on that makes the Davids want to reach out to Casey two days before this incident. Now, we don't know what it was said, but y'all can use your common sense. And that's one area where I actually agree with Ms. Sturm. You do not check your common sense at the door. Use your common sense. Activities going on. They're probably talking about the activity and talking about how the Davids respond to that activity. Like maybe if you see workers out there, go up there and tell them to stay off of your property. Stay off your property. Which we've got different stories as to what happened. We've got Tracy Anderson says, I was in my basement office. I heard her yelling at my workers. Heard her threaten to call the cops. Mrs. David says, oh, it was a very pleasant, very pleasant conversation. A uh, pleasant conversation with this man who does not speak English. I got his card, called his boss. Very pleasant. Nothing real. Clear. Claire Anderson. Claire Anderson testified. And the one person who has taken this stand, who has absolutely not been impeached or attacked for anything she said or has done in this case, is Claire Anderson. What did Claire say? She didn't hear everything, but she saw this landscaper, this uh, uh, Mexican guy, come up and, and he was just frantic. He was scared to death. Does a landscaper appear scared to death if he's had a very pleasant conversation with Stacy DeVee and given him, given her his boss's business? No, that does not make sense. And then Tracy gets this phone call. He's very mad. When he sees her, he goes out there to talk to her. And he tells her, don't yell at my workers. Don't tell them not to do my work. And then we have a dispute. We have a dispute. According to Tracy, she says, you're a horrible man. You've had multiple wives. According to her, she was very peaceful, didn't say anything, waited until he called her a fat so-and-so and told her she was going to die and all these other horrible things. And then her reaction was, well, you're certainly a gentleman. No, that didn't happen. And then also, when you look at Ms. Sturm's billing records, there's a whole lot of communications on that day. But then you look at her billing records for March. <clears throat> March 8th, travel to and from site inspection. Why does she need to go out to look at easement two if all they're working on is this horrible, vicious verbal assault by Mr. Anderson for which they're working on the TPO? No, that doesn't add up. Don't check your common sense. They are building their counterclaims, which they didn't intend to be counterclaims. They intended to be the plaintiff and going first. 
And then March 11th, Casey Sturm, identify appraisal expert, Mr. Shostak. They are wasting no time whatsoever building this lawsuit. So any of these suggestions that I'm to blame for being here, no. And then you continue on. You get into April, uh, April 1st. This is page six of Exhibit 30, Defense Exhibit 35. April 1, uh, receive review email communications from Randy Edwards. Talk to Randy Edwards. So she and I are talking for the better part of a week. She's building a lot of time for talking to me. Can't tell you what was said, but I think you get the gist. Those communications are why, we're, why we filed the lawsuit, because we knew that we'd be here. So yeah, we filed suit first. We beat him to the courthouse. But make no mistake, if it wasn't, and if y'all, hopefully not do, y'all, if it wasn't Anderson versus David, it would be David versus Anderson. Plain and simple. That's, that's the truth. No question about it. <clears throat> and let's talk about the nuisance. The nuisance is that we're clear the nuisance that we com are complaining about is, are those nets, those big, ugly, bold ribbons, all that stuff. And this, this isn't a case, you know, Ms. Sturm tried to tell you that what they're arguing is if your kids go out in your backyard and play volleyball, it's a nuisance. No, 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 no. We're not saying that. We're saying if your kids have a big old huge backyard, but instead they come over to my property. That's a nuisance. That's a nuisance. And that didn't start until August, uh, August 12th. And you'll see Ms. Stern's email communication. You remember Mr. DeVee was sitting right here. I asked him if he was aware of these email communications between Ms. Stern and I, where we, our side, was trying to de-escalate antagonism between the parties. Boom. Don't know anything about it. Didn't know anything about it. Well, when you look at her records, there's multiple emails to and from Jean Noel DeVee and Stacy DeVee on August 12th. Everybody's in the loop. Everybody's in the loop. Uh, the last on uh, the last entry on page 17, a uh, call from Stacy DeVee. Wonder what they're talking about. Maybe these nets. <clears throat> Top of the next page, call and discussion, name redacted. Also, by the way, they, they objected to my attorney's fees being redacted. You know, goose gander, ladies and gentlemen, look at theirs. There's a redact. <clears throat> so, make no mistake. We beat them to the courthouse and they're mad about it. They're not mad about being sued. They're mad that we beat them to the courthouse. <clears throat> so the judge is going to charge you that abandonment is non-use plus evidence of intent to abandon. The non-use, and, and you're talking about use. This occurred to me last night because I was driving home at 10 o'clock at night pulling in my garage, and I thought, you know, my next door neighbor's got a beautiful backyard. Got a swimming pool, a fire pit. Do I use that by looking at it? No. When he has me over for drinks or burgers, yeah, I use it. But just looking at his beautiful backyard from my deck or my upstairs window, that's not using his backyard. That's what they want you to think. Using is to actually do something with it actively, active use. You can't sit there and think, oh, that's beautiful and peaceful. That's not use. That's not use. But that's for y'all to decide. That's for y'all to decide. So on the verdict form, the first thing is, hey, uh, verdict. Sense. We yeah, find that easement two was or was not yeah, abandoned. Yeah, two seconds. Yes, right. obviously. This uh, we find that easement two was adversely hard. possessed. Adverse possession means that it was enclosed and used adversely to the law. Then it's actually going to be So when we talk about... The adverse possession or the enclosure, 
Here's an exhibit that you're going to take back with you. This is exhibit 22. These are these Google Earth Street View images. And the great thing about this is, is you have the dates. The picture was taken up here in the left-hand corner. And the first one, first page, was August of 2012. You see easement two, it's completely overgrown. Impassable. You can't use it for ingress or egress. The second page is from August of 2014. It's a more direct front view. Completely impassable, overgrown. You can't use it for ingress or egress. <clears throat> Third page. This is, let me get my readers. This is October of 2018, a couple of months after the Andersons bought the property. And you can see easement two is completely overgrown. And you can see this, the, the grass and the ivy kind of come up here to the front step in the walkway where these railroad cross tie walk, walkways are. That's November of 18. <clears throat> this is very interesting. The next image, page four of this, is from November of 19, roughly the same angle. Uh, Anderson's been there for a year. You'll be able to take these back with you and look at them up close, but when you do, you'll see if you compare them side by side, the grass has been extended considerably farther than it was. The ivy's been picked up. The the, it's been cleared. So, for Miss Sturm to say the first time they've heard any evidence that the clearing occurred before the Davids bought the property, she must not have seen this exhibit that was used in depositions. Because this is objective photographic proof that the easement had been cleared to some degree long before the Davids ever bought the property. And then the final page of this exhibit, this is a more direct shot from the street. And again, it's completely overgrown the easement frontage. <clears throat> so when we get to the questions of adverse possession and abandonment, you need to check yes on both. On the issue of nuisance, let me tell you <clears throat> what the law is, what Judge McBurney is going to tell you about nuisance. He's going to read the actual law, and I've got it here. Nuisance. A nuisance is anything that causes hurt, inconvenience, or damage to another. The fact that the act complained of may be lawful does not keep it from being a nuisance. So you heard... Mr. DeVee say, it's our lawful right to use this drill. Well, true, but that does not mean it's not a nuisance. If you go out, like I said, first line and open, if you go out of your way to intentionally annoy and harass your neighbors, that's a nuisance. These big, bold ribbons, these nets, are there for one reason and one reason only. It's not because Hopkins loves it. It's not because Hopkins thought of it. It's a big double middle finger salute to Tracy Anderson. Why? Because he got mad, got provoked, and made a mistake, and did something that he regrets to this day. That's why we're here. And when we're trying to de-escalate tensions, they're saying, no, sir. Turn it up. Turn it up. And I'm not going to talk about their claims much other than credibility of the witnesses. Because Judge McBurney is also going to charge you that the credibility of the witnesses is for you to determine. You may consider all of the facts of the case, the witnesses' manner of testifying, the probability of their testimony, their interest or lack of interest in the outcome. In considering credibility, you may consider evidence offered to attack 
a witness's credibility. This can include evidence of prior inconsistent statement and or bias. It may also be attacked by disproving facts to which a witness testified. So in, in terms of credibility, I'm a father. If a crazy man is waving a gun near my daughter and I'm not there, she calls me. I'm going to tell her, Mary, get the age out there. Mary, I'm on my way. I got to hang up because I'm calling the cops. That's what a parent does if it happened and if you're really scared. That's what people do. What they did, according to them, is they didn't tell them to leave. They didn't call the cops. They called their lawyers. That's what the Davids do because, as Kristen said, Mr. David says, that's why we have lawyers. No. If your kid's in danger, you call the cops. And this racial slur, the now Miss Stern is just calling a racial slur. She didn't hesitate to use it in opening. Mrs. DeVee didn't hesitate to use it on the witness stand. She claims to be just horribly humiliated and terrified from that. But if she's so humiliated and harassed, why was she so comfortable sitting here in this chair and using that term loud and proud? Not once, not twice. Not three times, I was keeping score of She used that term four times in a minute or two. Why? Why? Because they know that it's such an explosive term that they hope you will hold it against the Andersons. Well, again, if that really happened, There'd be a lot more evidence. There'd be a call to the cops, because that is a crime. That's uh, uh, disorderly conduct, making racial slurs to two or more people. That's a crime. They'd have called the cops. They'd have filed another temporary protective order. They'd have done all sorts of things. What'd they do? Call the lawyers. Call the lawyers. And <clears throat> Tracy Anderson pointed out Tracy, when's the first time you heard about this? Two days after the Georgia Supreme Court ruled against them. What a coincidence. What a coincidence. I'm being facetious, of course. Don't check your common sense at the door. That is a false, made up, 100% reprehensible claim that they would come in here they know they can't win this case on the facts or the law. So what they have done from day one is a total character assassination of this man because he made a mistake that he admits and he regrets and he's apologized for over and over and over again. But that's not good enough. That's not good enough. <clears throat> so at the end of this case, ladies and gentlemen, Judge is going to instruct you, you're going to get this verdict form. We want you to check yes to extinguishment on both abandonment and adverse possession. We want you to check yes on the compensatory damages for nuisance. The measure of damages is your enlightened conscience. Is that 5,000, 10,000, 50, 100? It's whatever y'all agree to. And the judge is also going to get in dry mouth. <clears throat> The judge is also going to instruct you on what we call a quotient verdict. That's where y'all decide, everybody write down a number. We're going to add it up and divide it by 10. That's our number. If you agree ahead of time, you can't do that. But if you agree, we'll do that and use it as a starting point. And then you'll say, well, that number is too high. That number is too low. Let's adjust it. That's fair. You can do that. So we want you to use your enlightened conscience 
and come up with a verdict in our favor for compensatory damages. And remember, it's been going on for two and a half years, since August of 12. Two and a half years of this constant double finger salute of we're, you know, we're, we're gonna do whatever we want because we have a legal right to do so. And then on the trespass for the workers, <laughs> I guarantee you we would not be here if that was the only claim. If you wanna give us a little bit more money on that, that's fine. If you don't, that's fine too. Again, we've proven it. Measure of damages is up to you. Whatever you think on that is fine. But also the punitive damages, check the box yes on that, and the attorney's fees. Because the judge is gonna instruct you on attorney's fees. If a party acts in bad faith in the underlying transaction, you can award attorney's fees incurred as a result. The bad faith in the underlying transaction is us trying to say, time out, time out, time out. Stop these nets, stop these clearings, stop this, stop that. And basically build 5.3 hours on that day, 5.3 hours. Mr. David said, whatever the advice was, he followed it. That is bad faith in the underlying transaction. And let me talk about Hopkins. Good kid, good kid. Plays, look, uh, my daughter went to Love It. Uh, I know that Love's got an outstanding lacrosse program. The coach is a friend of mine. Uh, he's a freshman, made the varsity. That's, that's pretty dang good at Love. That kid, kid didn't want to be here. He didn't want to be here, y'all saw that. He didn't want to be here. At least he didn't repeat the slur they made up. He knew better than to do that. But seriously, again, check your common sense at the door. Is he really afraid of Tracy Anderson? Is he afraid of Tracy Anderson? No, no, absolutely not. Because even the incident with the gun, he said he went back out there immediately. Seriously? <laughs> again, there's no way I'm letting my daughter anywhere near that property ever until this is resolved. But hey, it's Christmas, everybody's out of school. It's 11 o'clock at night. Hey, let's take this fire pit over there and have a little cookout. Is that what you do if, when you're Hopkins David? Is that what you do if you're really afraid of this man? No, no, it's not. And the parents of the other eight kids, can you imagine how furious they would be at the Davids if anything bad happened to their kids. And they said, well, yeah, we knew he was crazy. It didn't happen. They're not afraid of it. This is made up. This is made up, ladies and gentlemen. So let me just wrap up and say this, kind of to echo what Kristen said at opening. She said, words, words speak, uh, actions speak louder than words. You know, my younger days, I played football. I was with my coaches. One of my coaches used to say that what you do speak so well, I don't need to hear what you have to say. That's exactly the same thing. What they do <clears throat> speaks so loud, we can't, we can't reconcile it with what they say. Because you're gonna see pictures of little trivial things that supposedly bother them. The picture of the fence going up, the picture of the worker on this side of the fence. Uh, the picture of the trash in the dumpster. Those are trivial, trivial matters. What you're not going to see is a picture of this beautiful, lush, landscaped easement when we bought it or when we walked in. What you're not going to see are pictures of the surveillance camera pointing at my daughter's window. You don't see that. And most importantly, you heard Mrs. David say, talking about her surveillance system. They've got a ring camera system around their house. They have a ring camera above their carport, which faces easement area one, the parking pad, which is where these, where she and Hopkins were allegedly standing when all this slur took place. Why didn't they go in there and check the video and the audio and say, save this, save this? Because it didn't happen. 
It did not happen. And just finally, one thing, another thing that popped up, why didn't we hear from the witnesses? We, we explained, you heard testimony that it was the Anderson's uh, daughter and son-in-law who were witnesses to this. Why didn't we hear from them? Well, the reason we didn't hear from them is simple. We never heard this story until y'all did. We never heard who the alleged witnesses were. We didn't know it was Holly and Will until it came out of Mrs. DeVee's mouth. And Claire told you they moved to Washington, D.C. So what are the odds that when the time that we heard that come from Mrs. DeVee, I don't know, 12 o'clock yesterday, we're going to say, get on the phone, hey, Holly, Will, get on the plane, be down here in the next 30 minutes. Crazy. So, ladies and gentlemen, at the end of the day, which is very soon, y'all need to stop this. You need to stop this. Find the easement extinguished. Find in our favor on the nuisance claim. Award some measure of damages and award attorney's fees. And if, and if you think that, well, Mr. Edwards, we shouldn't give you fees from March and April and May. Fine, you got my you got my statements. Cut out everything from August from March 26th to August 12th or August 11th. That's when the nuisance. That's when they hatched the idea of this nuisance. So that's fine, ladies and gentlemen. I apologize for being here. We shouldn't be here. I recognize that. We should not be here, but we're here for one reason and one reason only. As I said at the end of my opening, it's that incident on February 24th, 2021. That is not a captive trial. Was it rude? Yes. We need to stop this. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. So, Ladies and gentlemen, um, my thought is I just give you charge now and then you go ahead. Okay. So has anybody's opinion changed with the closing arguments? I think that the Anderson's lawyer did a lot of damage to their case in the closing. I think that he did everything that the jury would dislike. They wanted to get out of there, and he did beat the that horse. <laughs> what? He did the exact opposite. Yeah, he drug it out, and he, he laid it, and he, uh, instead of making Mr. Anderson look relatable, he made him look... Um, hoity? I, I, I don't know. Okay, so I'll say from my perspective, and then I would love to hear what Dave Dog has to think. Um, from my perspective, I actually think that it was ineffective, but it was what he was basically told to do. So I don't think that it worked. I don't think that it came across well, but I think it's what he was asked to do. So I'm, I'm not gonna come down hard on him because I don't think that's fair. Um, what do you think, Tiff? To, so, be, to be honest, I, I, I actually had and it might have been my technical issues, but I had a hard time following him a little bit. Fair. Um, because I don't believe there was a lot of legal argument to what he said. Am I no. wrong? You're not. No, really none of them. They, they all, this whole case, there's hardly been any legal argument. It, it's all been just fluff and, you know, 
Well, can I jump in a little bit to try and bring some legal argument to it? Because I agree with both of you that there was not a lot of legal argument here. I think what he was trying to do, not in my opinion, particularly successfully, was to argue that whether you agree on the original easement running with land or not, there was certainly a question about whether they were aware when they purchased the property of it running with the land. I'm not saying that's a great legal argument, but it's at least something. And he was also trying to attack the David's credibility. Correct. And rightfully so. There, there's, there's a lot of documentation um, that can't be used as evidence because it's privileged. The two but attorneys it, talking it, to each other back and forth. Were, in order to okay, you got to stop I'm talking sorry. over everybody. I apologize. I'll be done in just a second and I will give you your turn. I promise. During one of the discussions, they presented the evidence. Um, I think I showed it on this stream. It might have been on the members only stream where when the two parties were going back and forth, they were trying to de-escalate the situation and find a some kind of compromise between the two. And right at that time is when all of the activity started on the property from the Davids. And so they're saying that they were, when I was trying to de-escalate things, you know, we were trying to solve them. They're over there instigating, you know, poking the bear. And that was, that was what he was trying to to convey, and I don't think he did it quite as well as he should have. Go ahead, John. No, I'm gonna sit quietly. I'd like to hear what you have to say before I. Can I'm end. done. I'm. You can. I just. You can't understand when two people are talking at the same time. Nah, no, it's fine. I'd like to hear what the other person in the room has to say, and then I'll give my two cents. Oh, there goes Tiff. All right, well, how about we hear what Judge McBurney uh, has to say? This is going to be um, the but um, if you want to revert jury to what instructions. We Let's do this. Which, um, Deputy Gordon, do you mind playing the role? Of the reason I included this is because the actual charges, the counts, the, um, ah, my brain's getting mushy. It's late in the day, are in there. They're, they're, they've become very convoluted with all of this other garbage in the trash can and everything else. I don't know where you went either. I thought <laughs> she's like, I'm out of here. Dumpster fire. Like I said, I, I'd prefer to hear what both of you have to say before I give my two cents. Okay, let's hear the instructions. And by the way, if anybody wants to know this I, is I mean, I'm going to simply for the jury instruction because I've heard these a million times. Okay, well, these are actually, were very specific to this case. So, there. I'll have them running in the background. Yeah, you don't have to listen, but it, it's the point of I, what I, the actual I've, charges are for. Yeah, I've heard them a million damn times. Moving that screen. Um, so, the jury charge that I'm going to give you is the law that you must apply to the case. I'll tell you a couple of things about it. It's this document. You will have this with you during your deliberation, so you should feel free to take notes. There are some legal concepts in Georgia that I am required by law to describe in a way that when you hear it, you're going to say, why are you talking this way? That's not how people talk to each other. It's very legalistic, but there are higher courts that have said, here's how you must define X. And so I'm bound to use those words. But when I am able, I try to make the jury charge accessible to me and to you because you need to understand it because you have to apply it. To aid in that, I will be reading it to you out loud as I must. What I'm reading to you will also be on that screen there. I have put it in a PowerPoint. I'm just sort of clicking along um, uh, as I read this to you. Um, feel free, like I said, to take notes, but this document will be with you word for word. Um, so you will absorb it as 
you see fit. Let me get it. So we experience it. All right, so this is a jury charge, big letters, and can we just move new words? Yes. yes. Excellent. All right. So um, without further ado, Ladies and gentlemen, you have been considering the case of Tracy Anderson and Claire Anderson versus Stacy David and Jean Noel David. The plaintiffs filed this suit for trespass, nuisance, adverse possession, and attorney's fees. The defendants have answered these charges by denying liability and bringing their own counterclaims for interference with easement rights, trespass, conversion, and attorney's fees. As you know, this case is about an easement, easement two, that burdens the Anderson's property and benefits the Davids. The meaning of the terms of the easement is a legal question for me to answer. What follows is my direction to you about the meaning of the language of easement two. Easement two allows the Davids to use the easement area for any legal purpose whatsoever. They may use or build on it in any manner they wish, consistent with local and state law. The Andersons may not materially interfere with the David's use or enjoyment of their easement. However, the Andersons, as owners of the land burdened by the easement, are free to be on and use the easement land so long as that use does not interfere with the David's use or enjoyment of the easement. I'm going to give you an example. This didn't happen in this case, so this is purely hypothetical. The Davids could build a koi pond on easement two. That is something that's allowed by the law, telling you it's okay to build a koi pond. They stock it with koi. They love their fish. They like the pond. When they're not on easement two, admiring the koi, the Andersons are free to go on to easement two and similarly admire the koi or ignore the koi, but not disturb the koi. What would be inappropriate would be for the Andersons to fish the koi and grill the koi on the grill we heard about and eat them and take away all the koi. That would be something that materially interferes with the David's <laughs> use and enjoyment of their easement. They decided to put in a koi pond, which they can do, and they stocked it. The Andersons can come enjoy it as long as there's not interference. But if their way of uh, enjoying it was spearfishing the koi and eliminating all the koi, that's something that you could find would be materially interfering with the David's use or enjoyment of their easement rights. Hypothetical, not this case, not suggesting there's any evidence of any koi or bond in this case. The plaintiffs must prove their claims by what is known as the preponderance of the evidence. That is, Evidence that is sufficient to incline, think of those scales, um, a reasonable and impartial mind to one side of the issue rather than the other. Now, as I've mentioned, the defendants have filed what we call counterclaims. The defendants claim that the plaintiffs owe them instead of the defendants owing the plaintiffs. The defendants must prove their counterclaims, if they are able to, by the same preponderance of the evidence. If neither side proves their case by a preponderance of the evidence, your verdict would be in favor of the defendants without any monetary recovery. Evidence is how facts are established or proved. Evidence includes all of the witness testimony you've heard. I think there were one or two pieces where I said disregard that, continue to disregard it, but 99 point many, many, many nines percent of the testimonial evidence is for you to consider along with the exhibits that have been admitted. And um, Mr. Edwards is holding some up. Those will go back with you to look at pictures, videos, etc. For the videos, we don't actually hand you the videos, but if there are videos you want to watch again, 
you just send me a note saying we want to watch that video that showed uh, Hopkins playing lacrosse and interacting with Mr. Anderson. We'll press play and you'll get to watch it again. You'll just come out here to do that. Everything else will be back there. Mm -hmm. Evidence does not include opening statements, or closing arguments, any questions asked, or anything else the attorneys or I have said. Now, during trial, you were permitted to submit questions. The answers to those questions are evidence. You should draw no conclusions or inferences from the fact that some of your questions were not asked. Questions are not evidence, only answers are. And importantly, in considering the evidence, you may use reasoning and common sense to make deductions and reach conclusions. Now, evidence may be direct, circumstantial, or both. An example of direct evidence is the testimony of a person who asserts that she has actual knowledge of a fact, like an eyewitness. I saw the car run a red light and collide with the other car. I saw it. Circumstantial evidence is proof of one or more facts that tend to prove some other fact by inference. I saw all these people walking in this courtroom, they had umbrellas, they were wet, but we can't tell that it's raining here, there are no windows. You could infer circumstantially that it's raining out because everyone's coming in with umbrellas and they're wet. There's no legal difference in the weight you may give to either direct or circumstantial evidence. And you should not be concerned about whether the evidence you're considering is direct or circumstantial. Testimony has been given by a witness who was designated as an expert. Expert witnesses are those who, because of their training and experience, possess knowledge in a particular field that is not familiar to the average person. Expert witnesses may give their opinions based upon that training and experience. Testimony of an expert like that of all witnesses is to be given only the weight and credit you think it should receive. You must determine the credibility or believability of all the witnesses who appeared before you. In doing so, you may consider all the facts of the case, and you've got all of them now, the witness's manner of testifying, the probability of their testimony, and their interest or lack of interest in the outcome of this case. In determining credibility, you may consider evidence offered to attack a witness's credibility. This can include evidence of a prior inconsistent statement, something in a deposition, and or bias for or against a party to this lawsuit. Credibility may also be attacked by disproving facts to which a witness testified. Easements. An easement is a property right that allows someone who does not own property to access or use that property. An easement holder cannot be deprived of his right to use the easement so long as he is using it consistent with the terms of the easement. Reasonable enjoyment of an easement means enjoyment of the easement as the easement is defined. The owner of the property burdened by the easement may not interfere with the easement holder's reasonable enjoyment of the easement. An easement is not extinguished merely by non-use. There must be clear, unequivocal, and decisive evidence of an intent to abandon an easement. Where an easement is acquired by grant or deed, that's what happened in this case, there is no duty on the easement holder to make use of the easement in order to retain the easement. Mere non-use of the easement, no matter how long, will amount to abandonment. The fact that an easement holder does not immediately begin to use the easement or that he delays for several years does not result in loss of the easement. However, Non-use of an easement for over 20 years, should say at least 20 years, um, may give rise to a presumption of abandonment, although that presumption can be rebutted. The owner of the land burdened by an easement may not materially interfere with the easement holder's right to use or enjoy that easement. Such interference, if proven, is an intentional tort. Trespass. A trespasser 
is one who goes upon another's land without permission. A party can be liable for trespass if he has requested or directed that another commit the trespass. A trespass is also, so this is a different definition of trespass, is also any wrongful interference with someone's right to the use of property, such as an easement holder's right to enjoy use of property. No proof of actual injury to the land or diminution in the property's value is required to maintain an action for trespass. And trespass is an intentional tort. Nuisance. A nuisance is anything that causes hurt, inconvenience, or damage to another. The fact that the act complained of may be lawful does not keep it from being a nuisance. But this inconvenience or hurt that's complained of cannot be fanciful or something that would affect only someone of extraordinary or demanding taste. It must be something that would affect an ordinary, reasonable person. To constitute a nuisance, the act complained of must produce actual, tangible, and substantial injury to neighboring property or interfere with the property's use and enjoyment by persons of ordinary sensibilities. Nuisance is also an intentional tort. Adverse possession. Adverse possession is the right to property that a possessor acquires by way of continuously possessing the property or property right for 20 years. In order for someone to claim adverse possession, that possession must A, be made by the possessor, the person claiming it, not by some third party, B, not have originated from any fraud or trickery, B, that possession must be public, continuous, exclusive, uninterrupted, and peaceable. And finally, D, that possession must be accompanied by a claim of right. Actual possession of land may be evidenced by enclosure, cultivation, or any use and occupation of the land that is so notorious as to attract the attention of every adverse claimant and so exclusive as to prevent actual occupation by another. This is your shortest slide. <laughs> Conversion. <laughs> When someone wrongfully asserts control over another's personal property and deprives that person of possession of the property, it is a conversion. Agency. The relation of principal and agent arises whenever someone authorizes another to act for him or later approves the acts of another taken on the principal's behalf. The principal is bound and responsible for all the acts of his agent taken within the scope of that agent's authority. However, if the agent acts outside the authority given by the principal, the principal is not responsible. Before one can be bound by the acts of another who assumes to represent him, some proof of agency must be shown. You must determine the issue of agency in light of all the facts and circumstances of this case. The next few slides are about damages. Damages are given as compensation for injury. When one party is required to pay damages to another, the law seeks to ensure that the damages awarded are fair to both parties. If you believe that the Andersons or the Davids are entitled to recover, you should award them only the amount you believe is reasonable and just. A party seeking damages bears the burden of proving those damages. Damages must be proven with reasonable certainty. You may not award any damages which are speculative or based upon guesswork. Damages for continuing nuisance or trespass are not limited to those that have occurred prior to filing this suit, but may also be awarded for damages incurred during the pendency of this case. In a nuisance and in nuisance and trespass actions, there may also be recovery for damages to the person. The determination of damages for discomfort, the loss of peace of mind, unhappiness, and annoyance caused by trespass or nuisance is for the enlightened mind of the jury to decide. 
that would be one of those legal phrases I'm required to say. I think your minds are very enlightened, but I wouldn't normally say that. But the cases say it's your enlightened mind that must be set. So don't be unenlightened in the jury room. You get stuck. Nominal damages. If the injury is small or mitigating circumstances are strong, only nominal damages are given. The proper amount of nominal damages is for you to decide. Punitive damages. In some cases, there may be aggravating circumstances that warrant the awarding of punitive damages. Before you may award punitive damages, a party must prove that the other party's actions showed willful misconduct, malice, or that lack of care that would raise the presumption of conscious indifference to consequences. And this must be proven by a higher standards, clear and convincing evidence. So I want to say that this is a different and higher burden of proof than a mere preponderance. What that means is evidence that causes you to firmly believe each essential element of the claim to a high degree of probability. This isn't the scales tilting just a little bit. You're going to decide how much the scales tilt, but it's as far as it takes for you to believe in the allegations to a high degree of probability. Punitive damages, when authorized, are awarded not as compensation, but solely to punish, penalize, or deter. The expenses of litigation are generally not allowed as a part of damages. However, if you find that a party has acted in bad faith, or has been stubbornly litigious, or has caused the opposing party unnecessary trouble and expense, you may award attorney's fees. This bad faith concept that must be proven is bad faith relating to the underlying transaction, i.e. the alleged trespass, nuisance, etc., and not bad faith during this litigation. An award of attorney's fees and expenses of litigation is authorized even when only nominal damages are recovered. Ladies and gentlemen, by no ruling or comment that I have made during the course of this trial, have I intended to express any opinion about the credibility of the witnesses, the strength of the evidence, or which party should prevail in this case. My only interest in this case is to see that it is fairly presented according to the law and that you, as honest, conscientious, and impartial jurors, consider the case as instructed and return a verdict that speaks the truth. One of your first jobs will be to select a foreperson who will preside over your deliberations and who will sign the verdict to which you must all freely and voluntarily agree. You should start your deliberations with an open mind, consult with one another and consider each other's views. Each of you must decide this case for yourself but you should do so only after a discussion of the case with the group. Whatever your verdict is in this case, it must be unanimous, in writing, dated, and signed by the foreperson. And we do have a verdict form, so you have something to fill out. It poses the questions you need to answer, and your foreperson in the end will sign it, saying, we all agree to this. Your verdict should be based upon your opinion of the evidence according to the law that I have been giving you in this charge. You must consider the evidence without, uh, objectively, without favor, affection, or sympathy to either party. Now, if you find that so this slide should be entitled quotient verdict, it says that on the charge if you begin. Um, if you find that a party is entitled to damages, you must determine an amount to be awarded. It is improper to agree in advance to be bound by the figure that is calculated by each of you before you've deliberated at all, writing down a number, adding it together, and dividing by 10, <clears throat> averaging out the damages. That it'd be an improper calculation of damages. However, if you wish to use this method to arrive at an amount for discussion without binding yourself to accept that result, you may do so. You are not prohibited from accepting that result and adopting it as your verdict, if you believe from a preponderance of the evidence that the figure arrived at by this method represents just and adequate damages. However, you must first have found that the party is entitled to damages and you must all agree 
that that amount represents your verdict after the amount has been determined. During your deliberations, you must not communicate with anyone aside, outside your group. This is nothing new. It's how you've been rolling so far. Nor may you conduct any outside research. You have all the evidence in this case. If you feel like something is missing, that's what you're doing this whole weighing the evidence on the scale. Um, if you wish there was something more, maybe someone hasn't met their burden of proof. Don't supplement the evidence by consulting an electronic device. In fact, I'm going to help you with this because Deputy Gordon will be collecting all your electronic devices and we will hold on to them, including Apple Watches or equivalent, um, while you are deliberating. I promise you get them back, um, but we keep them while you're in there deliberating. Ladies and gentlemen, last slide. During your deliberation, should you need to communicate with me for any reason? Question, concern, it's not the pizza we ordered. It has to be in writing. Write it down. You can put it on one of your um, pieces from your notepad. You can take some of those cards back with you. Deputy Gordon will bring me that question, concern, note, whatever it is. I'll share it with the lawyers, and I will answer as I am legally allowed. And I add that last bit because sometimes you will have a great question and I have to write back, you're gonna to need to sort that out yourselves because the law doesn't let me answer that one for you. That's what you're supposed to do. If your question was, well, hey, who should win this case? Hey, come on, you figure that out. <laughs> it's usually not that, but it's sometimes, well, we don't understand, what does trespass mean? And I'm gonna say, read this, because I've told you what trespass means. And if this didn't work, shame on the judges, but this is how we define trespass. I'm not trying to dissuade you from asking a question, go ahead and ask, but just don't get frustrated throw something at us when you come back in if the answer is you'll have to rely on your collective recollection or this is something for you to work out. Plenty of times I can say, great question, here's your answer, and I'll put something in writing. Or if it's sufficiently complicated, the lawyers may say, bring them back out here, and I want you to recharge them, read this again, or supplement the charge in a way that we all agree. That's it. Thank you for listening. Um, I'm going to... Um, I need to talk with the lawyers about a few things to make sure we get all the evidence together to push back to you all. Don't begin your deliberations until you get that stuff. So put in your lunch order now. I'll take logistical questions in just a second. But go back there while you still have your electronic devices. Put in your lunch order um, and uh, get that going. Deputy Gordon will bring you the evidence. It's going to bring, it'll have this jury charge. It'll have this verdict form um, and everything that is um, for your consideration back there. That's when you start your deliberations. Um, right now, you should deliberate on what you want on your pizza, whatever it is you're going to order. <laughs> Did you have a logistical question? Well, I just had a question uh, about evidence. Um, would we get a copy of the court trans? I mean, the transcript or no? That's no. You may recall um, I said several times about note taking, no transcripts of testimony, which is why we give you the notepads. Um, but uh, we don't have transcripts of witness testimony. That's where you'd get the note. You'll have to rely on your collective re recollection. Hey, what did that arborist guy say about Richmond Fuzzy something? There was that plant with that funny name. You're going to have to remember. Or maybe it's in a report that you have, and you'll find it in an exhibit, but no transcripts. The videos that were played can be played again because those videos are exhibits. We'd like to see exhibit 12, or if you don't remember the number, don't fret. Just that video that had X in it. And if that's something you need to see again, we will make it happen. Okay. Other logistical questions? All right. The uh, back case. Uh, Sorry, we were taking a nap with my fuzzy new blanket. Did you see my blanket? Beautiful. It's bright and colorful. Oh, look at that. Do you know where I got it? I got it at my new merch shop with all kinds of cool stuff. Go to MegsCrimeWatch.com or MegsMerch.com. All kinds of cool stuff. All kinds of new designs, fun stuff for everything and everyone. I don't have any fuzzy of Rochester's though, I'm sorry. Oh, Tiffy's back.
Do you like my blankie? I love it. It really is soft. Like I, I usually I'm really picky about blankets and I ordered yeah. it and I'm like, I'm going to hate this. I really like it. And it the was... colors came out beautiful. Very. Yes. I like sharp colors like that. It is a throw blanket. They have different sizes. Check it out. <laughs> so it's going to the jury and ooh, we're split now. Oh. We're at 6832. Okay. What is your opinion? Well, there's so there's layers to this, right? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I, 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 I am struggling with with the impact on their fee simple rights. Like that's what I'm I'm struggling with. Uh, Andersons, I mean, on their rights of ownership. Um, you know, some people would argue they bought it knowing that. Yeah, but they still have a fee simple interest. Like they bought a fee simple interest. So that's that's the part that, uh, again, I struggle with because of the long standing definition of fee simple and what easements and right of ways and all of the things in between are supposed to do and allow. Um, you know, yeah, you can you can pretty much construct an agreement uh, to say, you know, I can wear my purple pajamas in your yard every Wednesday. Um, but that doesn't mean that you're actually legally allowed to do that. So I, I'm, again, I'm struggling with the, with the impact on their, on their fee simple. The fact that I don't even care about the gate so much. The fact that they are, you know, being punished for clearing and cleaning and, you know, doing things that you do to a yard when you want to mm -hmm. enhance, um, that's bothersome. Well, it's also it's right it's like their side yard or the, I think their house faces it, this way and it's right next yeah. to it. <clears throat> they don't have, because of the way their house is positioned, they don't actually have a backyard to be honest. No, it's their driveway. That, that pad, that, um, it's the David easement one. Yep. Um, so Do you have a, a definition of fee simple. Ooh, good question. Let's go to the Google machine because I can probably at this time of day not come up with a good one that would make sense. So, I know. <laughs> it's like double MS brain. <laughs> it really is. At the end of the day, and I did a tank, I did a thing today. I went to my daughter-in-law's, um, she's a teacher at an elementary school, and I went and read for March's reading month, I read a book to the class. So Aww. Not very close. <laughs> it's a bit of a drive. So, um, well, that's cool. So, you went and read to the kids. Yeah, my brain is already like a little bit burned out. But so, okay. So, fee simple is um, it's the highest form of ownership. That's what the Google machine says, and that's accurate. So, it's it basically states that you own the land, the soil, um, and anything that sits on it. Right. I You're think allowed. That's perfect right there the land yep. the soil and everything on it like mm -hmm. you you own it all yep you own nobody it else has any rights to it but you right right unless there are rights that you um that you give you know your mortgage company you give them certain rights to your property um for escalation purposes etc and you will grant them some things they can restrict you from doing like you can't have seven you know, whatever, what are they called? Barrels of gas on your property. Right. Um, yeah. Things. But yeah, it means that, that you have the right to do with it how you want. Um, and again, you know, within code violations and stuff like that, but, but the clearing again, things that you would do to a yard to enhance it. Um, I, I just, I, I really am stuck on that part of it. Uh, so I believe I they should in that sense. Yeah, I am too. I had the charges written down somewhere. So the jury is actually deciding on the charges of um, the conversion and the um, trespassing. Did he? Did they trespass by putting something in their dumpster? And for the that's the counterclaim, and then for the regular claim, it was. 
trespass the other way by using the property and nuisance for something. It, it was just all these abandonment, I think. Uh, that's not another Yeah, they were saying abandonment. So they, if they would have said abandonment, then yes, the easement agreement would, they would take control of it back. Yeah. You, it, so, and, and yeah, the abandonment doesn't work for several reasons. It, it just doesn't work for me. <laughs> They, 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 because you, it has to be a continuous ownership of a bandit, right? So somebody like would have to be, if, like, if Darby still lived there, right? If, Dar if the original mm -hmm. people were still there, yeah, you'd have more of a, more of an argument for abandonment, um, but not in this case. This, that, that is my biggest issue is that there was, there was no intended use. It wasn't like, uh, we've seen these cases before where there's easements and things like that. And there was one in, I don't know if it was Simpson or Middleton or something, there was a pole and it's like, they were supposed to move the pole over here so that they could have the driveway, but they didn't move the pole over here. They moved it over here and that's a problem. And so now they have to move it over here. And so these two neighbors are battling over where this, this pole is and they're moving it and it's going back and forth. And that, that was the big issue is where's this pole going to be, but it was a specific issue there, each person had their own rights that, to the area, and that's what was decided. This is just so vague and wide open that it. this is going to get appealed. And it's yeah. already been appealed. For those of you who don't know, that there was a um, partial summary judgment oh, last year granted in favor of the Davids. The Andersons appealed to mm -hmm. the Court of Appeals, who found in favor of the Andersons. And then the Davids appealed to the Supreme Court, who declined to hear the case. Mm -hmm. And I'm sorry, go ahead. And the Court of Appeals is the one that kicked it back down, right? Yes, the Court of Appeals. Yeah, um, yeah reprimanded it. Uh, my yeah. brain is not working. I'm mush at this point i wasn't expecting this to last so long <laughs> i wasn't expecting to talk until it was all over we actually see so in property law in my world we actually see quite a few of um of cases that end up at the uh court of appeals and supreme court levels uh because of the sheer lack of knowledge on the subject uh, it really, you really need a real estate attorney, a property law attorney, um, and, and judge who's knowledgeable on the matter because judges can be wrong. It's so that's different. What, Just like the thing what, with the trees that blew my mind. Like, why am I, why am I paying for 20 babies that in a year are going to be full grown and you can't even put that many on there? Like, they choke each other out, first of all. Like, that's yeah, not like, so you're just gonna buy something that's gonna die. I, I don't understand this. Yeah, uh, I, I, I took issue with that. I, I, I don't know. I, I, I took, I take issue with so much of this, and you know that I've done, I've gone way down the rabbit hole on it. Um, I did, I examined both properties, um, uh, going back very far over 40 years, and um. <laughs> Yeah, the the so so a lot of people are asking about um, the easement being voided, um, even even if that were a thing, which I don't believe that's even being argued here. Uh, that doesn't even define the property lines. Yeah, <laughs> the 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 easement in itself, the the description of the David property, it it, it gives that portion of easement too to the Davids, even though it's supposed to be correcting it. So it's, yeah. it's all over. there there needs to be when this is all said and done, an actual affidavit filed stating what the correct boundaries are because it's bad. And that's that's the big thing. Yes, I have the verdict. You will have the verdict within one minute. This is the big thing. It's it's never going to go away because Whoever owns the property that the Davids have right now has such a benefit. Why would they give that up? And that I mean, I guess unless someone's going to buy it, I don't see a court. I don't see a court taking that pad 
that they've had for however long. I mean, years and years, decades. Yeah. There's, there's, I don't see the easement getting, I don't, I don't see it getting. Stay off off. my lawn. (laughs) All right. (laughs) So there is actually not a video of the verdict. I was incredibly upset, freaking out. I didn't even think I had this last jury instructions because those were taken down immediately after they were streamed. So I didn't know what was going on. And then I thought, well, have they not come back? Did they reschedule it for later? Because Fulton County is still offline from a uh, cyber attack. That's right. You said that. So fortunately, I had McBurney's stream up. And they posted this message on the stream while he was doing criminal cases. If you followed the Anderson v. David trial, the jury awarded the Davids approximately $45,000 in damages plus full attorney's fees, $290,000. I strongly disagree with the attorney's fees. I don't think that this was... Some of it was obnoxious, don't get me wrong. But I don't think this case was brought frivolous, frivolously. No. There's no really- they were threatening to put a lien on their property. Yeah, I, I just I don't I don't feel like that was the case. So uh that'll be that'll we'll see how it's that's going is. to be appealed. Yeah, but sure. why are their attorney's fees so high? Uh how long is when was it originally? The filed? other attorney's fees were one twenty five. Mm. I mean, maybe they they did more research. I don't know. That's like I really hope they did a title search somewhere in there. That's a lot of money. Big Tiff, thank you for explaining ho. Oh, ho, ho. I like that. <laughs> the easement came about. It's supposed to say how, but it said ho. <laughs> the easement <laughs> came about. Meg and I are both typo people, so we appreciate the ho. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, my fingers stopped working. Yeah. Welcome to Fulton yeah. County. Hey, you could get your Welcome to Fulton County shirt at my new merch store. Woohoo! Megsmerch.com. Yay! Go get that. I just like making stuff. That's a good point. Who brought the tree expert? Maybe that's Um, that was defense. Uh, David's brought the tree expert. There you go. Well, of course, because it it was in their favor. And it seems like that might be part of the cost too. Yeah, homeowners insurance could pay it, but it's going to be appealed. Nothing's going to get done right now. It's going to be appealed. It was already appealed all the way up to the Supreme Court. You know it's going to keep getting appealed. Um, yeah. And they've even mentioned it. That um, I wouldn't be surprised if this went all the way up. Oh, yeah. And it this might actually be a case that gets hurt by the Supreme Court because it is a very interesting case. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you boil it down, the facts are not. You both have rights to the land. Work it out. Be adults. Mm -hmm. Get that over, you know, your egos and everything else and just deal with it. But when that can't happen, you're in this gray bubble where there's, there's no, you can't pick one or the other. They're, they both have to, you have to work it out. I guess it's kind of like a child custody case, you know, like mm. yeah, it when you're be, using it. These houses are forever entwined to each other in some way because of the way they are um, constructed. If you look at that map, it's they're they're too close, and those property lines are um, not straight. So they're they're forever entwined, and they they do have to figure it out. And again. Don't assume just because one judge ruled one way that that it'll um, stay that way. It was overturned before. There's there's no telling. And we know what the Court of Appeals opinion is, is that the owner of the property can't be excluded from use. So, like, in the 
Um, ah, <laughs> words are not coming like they should. Opinion? MS brain. Uh, no, the jury instructions, Judge right. McBurney was saying if the Davids wanted to use it, do whatever, when they're done, then the Andersons could use it, insinuating that they have priority over it. And they're really, I'm not aware of anything that says they would get priority. There, there's no priority. They just have rights. So and that's something that would be appeal appealable. Like, what if they set something up where they're using it constantly and preventing the Andersons from using it? What if they build a koi pond? Because it was jury instructions that that would be something legal that they could do. I didn't like that instruction. I don't think you could do that. It was a horrible instruction because it's actually not accurate because a reasonable person wouldn't use an easement to construct a koi pond. It's not reasonable. So, but the I don't know. Agreement is so vague. They can do whatever they want. Yeah. And I mean, if I'm drafting an easement that I want to be beneficial to me, that's absolutely how I'm drafting it. Right? Yeah. I, 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 I think it's horrible. But um, yeah. That, that, and I it's think like someone that, was on that law Zoom thing and just, you know, modified the, the template. Argument. Yeah. Nobody made the argument. Uh, the drafter was the beneficiary and or grant her, whatever, whoever it was, the grant her was the beneficiary. And, um, then it, like, like it was it, like, nobody made the argument that it was, it was self-serving easement agreement. Like they could, they missed arguments they could have made. That's all. I, yeah. They, they focused on the, they focused on the petty things. It's mm -hmm. like, they all got, they all got emotionally involved in this. And I think, Hoopers or what Hopkins or whatever is the cross. I could care less about that kind of stuff. I feel like the judge was very um, pro David. Yeah, I think the judge has a misunderstanding of some things, but that's just me. Don't hold that against anybody. That's take just care, me. Bruno. Yeah, hi, Bruno. I I really don't know it. it I think it's an interesting case, but it just, and, the and, whole thing is a mess. And, and that's the other thing I'm stuck on. Um, uh, Karen uh, Blank just said, you know, the Anderson's property is assessed and they pay taxes on both easements, I believe, technically, maybe yes. just easement. Uh, but. Oh, that's right. Because it's, it's off on the assessor's page. Yeah, it's got a, that dog leg of easement one out. And I really would like to know why, because I think it's because the deeds were wrong, but that's just me. Um, it, it's, again, that's where I think the reasonableness comes into play. It is not reasonable that somebody next door to me puts a koi pond on a piece of property that I own, that I am taxed for, because it's been enhanced now. And, and I'm just supposed to sit and watch. Well, and then let's look at liability. So Johnny from around the corner comes running by, doesn't know you have a ko koi pond, trips and falls in, and he kills all your koi because he squishes yeah. them. Who's homeowner's and he insurance? breaks his ankle. Right. Yeah. Now your what? neighbors are out the koi, and Johnny's got a broken ankle, and it's all on your property. Mm-hmm. Like, what kind of shit storm would that be? Again, unreasonable. It's not reasonable. It's not. And that's where I think that's that that statement alone being the koi pond thing being in the jury instructions alone is appealable. Like it's just bonkers. This is this is my personal take. The Andersons bought it and it was blown off like it was no big deal. No, whatever, it's an easement. The Davids bought. And it was, oh, look at this great thing you have. And the Andersons probably completely forgot it existed. So when they're out there doing their yard, they didn't think anything of it. And if they did think anything of it, it's like, well, yeah, it's there, but nobody uses it. So they want to walk across my yard to get to the road, whatever. And you just, 
it just, it is what it is. And you forget and you go on with your life because there's so many other things in life to worry about than an easement that was in a stack of papers this big that you signed when you were buying the house. And then all of a sudden you're putting sod down and this lady comes over screaming at your workers to stop doing it because it's her property. And you're like, what the lady? And I probably would have called her names worse than a fat bee, you know, if somebody came on my property, you know, in my mind at that time and told my workers to stop doing what they're doing and thinks that she can, who are you, you know? Yeah. I would have been, yeah. And that's again, where I think it's, I think again, it's, it's, uh, I don't know. It's unreasonable. That's just the only thing I can keep saying because it doesn't make, it doesn't make any sense. Um, and so Mark, Mark Blaine said on lakes, there are easements everywhere and people that can share will lose. Um, there's a famous story in Michigan about a house that had to be torn, a $400,000 house in 1992, I want to say, that had to be torn down because it was built too close to the lake and all of the other neighbors that were on the lake, it obstructed their view of the lake and it was in the deed restrictions. It was in, in agreement way back in the deed restrictions from the forties that you cannot build your house X amount of feet away from the lake. And it had to be torn down entirely. Oh my gosh. Because the neighbor sued. Lisa, so, there was a specific line in the easement agreement that says they can build a driveway. They could do whatever they want that is legal. So they could put in a koi pond. I mean, they could. It's not realistic. And if they started to put in a koi pond, then the Andersons would, you know, try and stop it. And that would be a whole separate battle and I don't even know what that would fall under I don't even know if they could stop them that agreement is so vague that I yeah I think litigation is the only thing that, that yeah, solves it. they need to get rid of that agreement or like say they say the Davids are very vindictive and and want to just make the Andersons life a living hell they have the ability to do that. Mm -hmm. Like they can do whatever they want. Yeah. Yes, Patricia, they would be. Um, the Andersons are still liable for it. That's their property. That's they're required to maintain it, to take care of it. They just can't interfere with the David's use of it. However, they decide to use it. Um, I had a point. I lost it. Dang it. Correct. Going into this, the Davids believed that they had exclusive use. They interpreted the word exclusive to mean to exclude the Andersons. And the Court of Appeals ruled that you cannot exclude the landowner from their own property. And so that's when it got kicked back down. My opinion, accurate. That is an accurate description of how the legality works. You cannot exclude the fee simple owner um, entirely. That just doesn't work that way. And again, there's case law and years of proof that says you can't do it that way. It's pretty rare to have an easement that's not tied to some kind of utility most, most easements are utility easements and or road uh, those are perpetual some easements actually in michigan they just ruled that easements only last four years 40 years unless they are revived but um the the utility easements and uh, road easements and stuff like that that are standard and state beneficial so to speak those are perpetual forever and ever um you'll see a right of way is typically like the how many feet off the road 
the, the state or whoever county owns and then the easements for utilities and stuff such are my father works the electric company and he has to renew them and and things like that and rewrite the agreements all the time yeah he says it's fun oh but yeah this this is exactly it she mm -hmm. she was dividing the land she wanted to make sure she still had she probably had the driveway all the way down she wanted to keep it so this is what she did and she put the perpetual cause clause in there to make sure that if the other person sold their property and she was still there, that she didn't lose those rights with no consideration for what would happen when she sold her property. She, well, she, right. why would she care? She'd be gone. Right. And we have to remember that house um, was built in 1946. Um, That's interesting. Yeah. And the Anderson's house was built 50 years later in 1990-ish, six. It says six and seven. It's kind of weird in a couple of different places, but yeah. So so Patricia says she has an easement through her neighbor's backyard so she can get the lawnmower in. Through here, so I can access mine with a lawnmower. Oh, probably um, so that it's it doesn't go completely overgrown and animals infest and all that kind of stuff. It's probably like um, between a fence area or something, yeah. an alley almost. So imagine if you like took over that space and told the neighbor they couldn't walk in that space. Like, you know how you claim a square back in school? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Wasn't that yeah. a game? <laughs> Where'd Tiff go? Oh. oh, you there? I'm here. Yeah. Canals are their own little, canals are their own little world of yeah. differences. <laughs> um, so the easement rights are, it's tied to the deed. And when you transfer the deed, what? Go ahead. Oh, so, uh, I'll, I'll really quickly. The no, please. So everybody, we all watch court, right? We all watch court. We know that a lot of court is based on notice, like in the foreclosure or excuse me, in the eviction hearings, you have to have notice that the hearing's happening, et cetera. So in property law, recording a document is called notice. So you're automatically on notice when the document is recorded. So anybody that goes to purchase a property can go to, um, you know, usually your title company does it, but you can go to the register of deeds or recorder of deeds, with different things in different states and review all of the documents that have been recorded against that property since it was created, if you want to. I mean, somebody has to go down to a boat somewhere sometimes, but uh, that. The fact that that easement was recorded in 1996, I believe it was, um, mm -hmm. puts everybody in the future on notice that it exists. So that's why it transfers, because it, it contains the language that say, states it transfers and the fact that it's recorded at the um, recorder's office. It's Everybody else is on notice forever that it exists until it's... And is that why they do a title, why you have a title search? Yes. Because you're supposed to know everything. And even if it wasn't, you're supposed to know that the person that's selling it to you has the right to sell it to you. Right. And that you're going to be the fee simple owner, that you're going to own it entirely. And you're going to have market title when, when uh, it's all said and done. And that means the ability to resell the property and you're, it also exposes all of the liens and easements and any other restrictions that might be recorded against the property restrictions are, um, are a whole nightmare, but yeah. McBurney is his name. Judge McBurney. Sorry, I keep looking down because I'm on the You're um, fine. mirror on my phone and I'm on, on YouTube on my app because I can't have both chats up for some reason. At the same <laughs> so I need a new laptop. Meg knows this. It's just not been a priority. Um, All right, Penny, you want to say bye? We're going to wrap it up. Come on. You want to say bye? I am stunned by no? this. Uh, Karen Blank, I am, I am, I am really kind of surprised by the verdict, but I'm shocked, especially since it got kicked back again. But I feel like there was there was a vibe in the courtroom, mm -hmm. and I think her saying that word so many times had an impact. Mm -hmm. Um, because I was able to see the jury, 
That's why there was a, a bar up on the screen because you could see part of the jury. And every day somebody different sat in those seats. They like rotated and you could see two people all the time. And it was a very diverse jury. And I think they believed that that was said and found it incredibly offensive. Yeah. And, and again, I, 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 I get why it was allowed. I get why it was allowed. It didn't had nothing to do with property law, but it did have to do with credibility, I guess. So. Yeah. Well, and it was part of the um, har harassment. Oh, you need a haircut so bad. I'm curious as to um, whether if this would have been a bench trial uh, entirely for all counts, if it would have come out the same way. I don't know. I don't know because uh, McBurney's incredibly fair, but you could tell he liked the David's a lot better. Mm -hmm. No, JB, uh, Mr. Anderson did not admit to the racial slur. He admitted to calling her a B word but not he adamantly denied that. So going back really quickly yeah, no kisses. and with the Anderson and, and everybody being aware of the uh, easement agreement. So when I say their deed mentioned it, I mean, the deed mentioned the exact date it was recorded. They, they call it a, a book or, or library, library and page number that it was mm -hmm. recorded. And so anybody could look at that and say, wait a minute, I want to review this. And um, that's why I love that everybody's learning a little bit about title today, because when you buy a house, you should absolutely ask to look at the title. You should, but and you've bought a house. You know what it's like when you sit there and they're like, sign this, sign this, sign this, sign this. And you do that so many times that you're not reading those things. You're trusting the person that you hired to do this for you to read those for you and tell you when there's an issue. So when you buy a house, um, title is actually prepared right away. So it's not something you have to wait until the day you're signing to review. They can show you the title in advance prior to you. Um, honestly, probably prior to even having the house appraised, you can look at the title and say, hey, these are things I have questions about. Anything you don't understand, ask the question. Call the title company. Don't rely on the realtor's answer. Call the title company and ask the questions. Tell them you want to review things. Have an attorney up front. In this case, it would save you $290,000. Right? Plus 45. Plus, <laughs> well, no, plus their own. Fees. Plus your 125 plus your 45. Right, right. It saved you a half a million dollars. That's half of what you paid for your house. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. For what? Yeah. So, I mean, well, I mean, who, who knows what it's going to end up being? It's going to end up being way more than that once they well, keep going. And, and, you know, honestly speaking in the real world that we live in where our houses don't cost 1.27 million, um, Music. a lot of people will just let things go that they should assert as far as their rights go. Um, so Look, they have matching shirts on. Oh my God. That's adorable. I know. I have issues. It's fine. We all do. Yeah. I, 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 again, it's funny to me a little bit that people, um, that put this much money into, uh, two people, two different, you know, families that put this much money into an investment like this probably didn't even bother to read the easement agreement, to be honest. I, I don't believe either. Oh, I'm sure they didn't. And somebody uh, explained it to them and on one side, they minimized it on one side, they maximized it. And so one of them thought that it wasn't a big deal. The other one thought, Hey, I practically right. own this thing. Right. So right. how, I mean, if you're buying that property, how would you not think of it as a, as a benefit? Although again, yeah. I mean, when this goes the other way and I believe it will, it's not going to be beneficial to them either. It, no, it's, it's going to be. JB says there must be a way to prevent this kind of nonsense. Oh, story of my life. Yeah, if you can get stupid people not to write stupid contracts, but anybody can write a contract about anything as long as it's signed and notarized and 
all day, every day. I see it all day, every day. And, and I mentioned it yesterday, you know, um, that little notch out in the a map where you can see the easement one is assessed, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the uh, DeVee's property, those legal descriptions at the, at the county level are often wrong. We have to have, we see, you know, in the foreclosure process, we see a lot of times where affidavits have to be filed correcting them because they're wrong. So just because the assessor says it doesn't mean it's right. Doesn't mean it's accurate. Just because a surveyor says it, I have gone round and round with a surveyor. That happened to us. We, my, my grandmother sold a piece of property. It was one piece of property that was split in two years ago. Mm -hmm. And when it was sold, we noticed that the second piece of property never got an address (laughs) and it still had the legal description of the entire property. Yeah. Yeah, we've, mm, I've seen them. I've seen that happen quite a few times. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, so. so, so the assessor all that time was probably even collecting taxes on both value. Like, that's the thing. They don't have to maintain it. There's, there is not, no law, rule, anything in place to enforce them maintaining it. However, code enforcement will come out and fine the Andersons. For anything that is not unacceptable on the property, like if right. there's trash, if there's you know broke down cars, whatever, whatever it is that violates, I'm sure it's a lot more than that in that neighborhood. But <laughs> <laughs> then they can be fined for it, and the Andersons are responsible for maintaining it. That's where this it comes in that it it is very un unfair the way that the agreement reads yep unfair and unreasonable i I really believe that um and that's where i think they will prevail eventually just knowing what i know yeah because contracts you when you have a contract there has to be two sides and both sides need to have some benefit from it and in this contract, the Andersons have zero benefit, and they're actually being hurt by it, right? I explain that right. You did. I was I'm making that face at a comment. Sorry. <laughs> oh, okay. So it. Yes, dear. What's the matter, Zeg? I'm tired. It's so Actually, time. it's 17 minutes past dinner time, so. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've done seven whole minutes. My goodness. Should I call the ASPCA? He might pass out from, you know, low blood sugar. <laughs> you going to make it? I don't know if he's going to make it. You going to make it? Maybe. Maybe. I would really like to know too much why that large of a portion was carved out for easement too. I don't know. I think I could why this case all day long. Yeah. Um, because I didn't feel like that was necessary, but. Because she probably just didn't care or actually she probably already had the driveway there when she was living there. That's what I think. And and, and that and, was the cutoff to the top of the driveway. Yeah. Yeah. That would make sense because this, I won't get too nerdy about it, but this plat overlays an older plat. Mm-hmm. So in the older plat, I think lots, what is now lots 11 and 12, I think it was just one lot mm-hmm. called 115. Um, and then it was redeveloped, so to speak, time and, and split down. Uh, which can happen, but did it include the lot on the other side too? Yeah, no, no, I don't believe so. Um, what would that be? Ten? Yeah. I... Okay. I Maybe could I'm be... thinking of something else. I could be wrong. We couldn't find a visual of that plat, but according to the deed chain, it didn't appear to. It just appeared to be uh, eleven and twelve. <laughs> yeah it's okay i'm being told that it's time to go and get dinner yeah he him's hungry yeah 
<sighs> so thank you all for a wild week. It's been a fun journey. And I'm not going to do this again for a while. But I can't. I, I can't wrap a hole again for a while. Yeah, I no more rabbit holes for a, <laughs> at least a day or two. I like rabbit holes, don't get me wrong. But it's harder when you're in one that's about something you know so much about. I've been doing this for 30 years. 30, yeah. holy crap, 32 years. Um, Just a minute, please. So, yeah. <laughs> it was it was a roller coaster for sure. Like, I, <laughs> I started watching it and I'm like, an easement. When she told me about page it, two I'm of an easement, <laughs> and then they start throwing around these racial slurs, and I'm like, "What in the?" <sighs> Literally thought, "Eh, boring. Easements are boring." And <laughs> I told you to watch this how many times before <laughs> you finally did? <laughs> I look at easements all day long. I look at bad easements. I look at good easements. I look at that. I'm, I'm like, "Yeah, this kind of stuff happens all day long." This was interesting not just because i'm a property it was interesting period i'm glad that everybody enjoyed it too <laughs> he wasn't he didn't have an opinion of his own every day his opinion changed he would find a comment everything i would say he would respond with the opposite and when i finally called him out on it then he got hissy and started making comments about well i'm not allowed to talk i didn't say that oh. No. I made a snarky comment back to you. It was half in jest. The other half was, okay. It's, it was fun the first couple times, but after 20 times of, you know, I, okay, I get it. Mm -hmm. I like debating, but there's a point where it's like, okay, yeah, we've, we've hashed out. Yeah. The horse is dead. Mm -hmm. Let's, let's move on. <laughs> oh gosh. Yeah, uh, very interesting. I have to figure out what I want for dinner. <laughs> I understand, Nanya. I'm not gonna. Yeah, I'm not gonna comment on that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Omg, would that not be hilarious? Nude. <laughs> oh my god. Doing that pose, you know? Right. Oh my gosh, that would be funny. Yeah. She was a piece of work. She rubbed me the wrong way, like instantly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I, immediately, I felt the same. Not a fan. Not a fan. Not a fan. Mm -mm. Did you guys notice that I had to totally redo my, my whole printer stand and everything? Because, hold on. Let me see if I can move mm. this. Did you see the cat? Oh, yeah. They were knocking my printers and everything off the stands to get to the window. So I had to get a cat tree to put in the window. The patch of light. My life is ruled by animals. <laughs> All right. So I am going to go feed the animals before they start plotting to kill me in my sleep. And I appreciate you all as usual. You're amazing. Thank you for your support. Thank you for hanging in there. Hit the like button on the way out if you're not subscribed. Hit subscribe because, you know, I do this every once in a while and sometimes it's entertaining and sometimes it's educational. And you something. can disagree with everything we said. Still hit that like because you like <laughs> <laughs> oh. All right. Take care, everyone. Bye.